For years, I've had people ask me at seminars, especially a lot of young people, if you could give me one good tip that'll make me a better fisherman, what would it be? Got it. Every chance you get to go fishing, go. I don't care what the weather is. You get a chance to go, go. It'll force you to fish different baits in different situations in different parts of the lake, and you're going to learn something. I promise you you're going to learn something. And on some days, you're going to have a bite of fish that will shock you when everybody else will say, I'm not going today. It's a post-frontal condition, crystal clear skies. Those fish ain't going to bite, and you just wail on them. And there's sometimes logic isn't the answer. It's just put your boat in the water. You can't catch them if you're not out in the water. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. Oop, there's one, there's one out. Go! Wow, you hit it pretty good. Oh, ah, not bad. Boy, a little bit thin, starting to fatten back up. Just got done spawning and get her back in the water. There's probably more where that <laughs> one came from. Here's the deal, plan A didn't work. We went, went to a lake we couldn't even put the boat in. The wind is blowing 20 to 30 miles an hour with gusts push, pushing the mid 30s to high 40s. Uh, we, we, the plan was to do a frog show. We couldn't get to the first two lakes we wanted to go through. Jim says, I know another lake here a little bit. We could beat the wind a little bit, the back arms. It got a lot of wood in it, some shallow water frog, frog water, and uh, let's go, at least we could fish. Your, one thing about, <coughs> about, about fishing, you're always adjusting to your local, <coughs> local weather and water conditions. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. You fish a lake in a way you, you've never fished it before because of the weather conditions and sometimes bad conditions that force you to change your thinking helps you become a better angler. It opens your mind to situations uh, where you can make adjustments. It's trying to make the best of what plan A and plan B were to start with but never happened. I have no idea what to expect for today. No idea whatsoever. See, there's a big stump right there. And it's, I'm just reeling my jig past the stump. That's one thing nice about this live where you got subsurface cover that a lot of times you can actually see it really good. You can actually see the fish moving around the cover in some cases. Saw one right there. He's about 20 foot that way. You can see my bait dropping in right there. Right there. See if I can. Oop, there's one. There's one. Oh, big one. Nope. There we go. That's a good one there. Oh, come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. Whoa. Nice, <laughs> Whoa. Here, come here. That's a nice one. That isn't a bad one. Huh. A little bit better. I'm actually taking the jig and actually sort of fishing it both ways. You know, when you see a piece of cover, I'll flip it over by it, but a lot of times what I've been doing, taking this jig and just actually uh, swimming it in between spots. Right now, that's actually this fish probably just got done spawning like in the last couple of weeks, actually. You can see by even the, the last couple of fish we caught, but one thing that's, you know, that's sort of interesting that's actually directly after the spawning, you're talking about uh, jigs. And a lot of times you use you know heavy jigs for flipping and uh, you know specifically casting the things. Right now I'm fishing with a very very lightweight jig. A lot of times these fish after they just got done spawning, that slower drop speed seems like to be really an advantage. Oh, like that one there. Oh, <laughs> you know that slower drop speed where you can let it sit there in front of them for a little bit. You know right after they get done spawning, they can have the tendency to be a little bit uh, discriminatory on what the uh, how fast the bait is moving. And I know one thing for at this time of the year, this is a really key time for lightweight jigs. This one here, I gotta. I think this is actually like a an eight, a very lightweight bait. You can just see these other logs. I just got 
this is sun, and you know, sunglasses are critical. You know, waving labor is what we, what we use, but I, you can see all these individual stumps. And even in back, he's fishing some of these shallower ones. I can look off at the back here where I'm picking apart some spots that he's not picking apart. There's one big one. Whoa, whoa, no. Wow, that's a better one. I thought it was a real big one, though. It was a nice one, though. Come here, buddy, whoa. I know one thing, you know, as far as uh, early season ba bass fishing, this is sort of cool in the fact that you get up on these shallow flats and what you're doing is targeting the best habitat. And the fu fun part of it is because you're actually target fishing, you know, you're flipping to, you know, isolated cover that you can see, whether it be clumps of uh, developing weeds or in this case, you know, we're casting uh, stumps, isolated stumps up on this flat, but it's just such a fun technique, you know, and you get up on these spots and you flip it in where it's supposed to be, and this guy shows up and, and hammers the bait. We'll get her back. You can see there's just a Terminator Pro Spear Series jig. It's got a really stout hook on it, relatively short shank, and I'm just putting a plastic trailer on. This is a big bite flapping craw, one of my all-time favorites, and you'll notice the color, green pumpkin. <laughs> This segment is brought to you by Wavy Label Eyewear. Backed by a lifetime warranty, we see what others don't. Look at that there. Bluegill beds all over right here, Al. Right to our right, a bunch of big bluegill beds. See that dimpled bottom right in here? That's what all that yeah, is. Yeah, I see them. Bluegill I beds. see them. I see the inside imaging too. It's one thing, you know, today's day and age, you look at the different sonar technology, and I got three different ones going here. 2D sonar, three mega 360, and you can see these all these bluegill beds, and then I have mega live up in front. It's what this sonar enables you to do is gives you a far better understanding of what's going on around you. You know, it wasn't that long ago when we just had like a struggler 2D sonar. Now you actually have all this, you know, primarily these sonar technologies that really helps you get a wider look at the underwater landscape. Interesting, those bluegill beds, um, apparently, apparently they're, they may have, not and bluegills can't be done, Jim, it's 70, 70 something degrees. They ought to be, still a lot of fish on those beds. I sure think so. Early 70s. Usually those bigger large mouths start keying in on those. In that uh, area. There's one. Oh, there's a good one. There's a yeah. Oh. No. Same stuff. Well, you got in like a little isolated wad of uh really shallow trees up on this flat. It seems like there was like three or four right in that little spot right there. There we go. Well you can see that they're just starting to get bend back up after the spawn. You know, so many different times you go out on the water, you know, you have to adjust to the various conditions you're faced with. We initially went over this flat, caught some fish on jigs on isolated wood. Now we're gonna go back through the same spots where I laid the coordinates down with finesse baits. Right now I have a big bite uh, trick stick on with a little uh, VMC Ned, Ned head rig, and then Al's throwing the Nico rig and we're gonna see what happens here because I suspect we're gonna catch a number more of fish and you know like anytime you fish over air areas you, you catch them on one bait but in a lot of cases you, you initially come back through there with different presentations and you will catch more fish on alternate presentations. Right under the boat. James you weren't lying you were telling me the truth. The one two spring guaranteed spring bass bite if you got to get nice fish. Whoa. Oh, look at that one, huh? It's a good one. Nico, Nico strikes again. You can't go wrong with a Nico rig when you got to get a bite. There's no question about that. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I told you, I told you so. We come back through, we're going to get some of the better ones, and that's one of the better ones. That's the kind of fish we came here for. Yeah, although I expected to catch him shallow on a frog. We're making the adjustment like we always do. Seems like every day is a new deal. Every single day is a new deal. 
throughout the day, at different times, there's a new deal. <laughs> and that Nico is simply, it's simply nose weighted. Yeah, a little bit tiny lightweight in, in the head. Then you got the protector for wacky and it will weight system. It's so simple. Those Nico hooks are, are like needles. You know, one thing with the jig, what we were doing, we're moving through here really, really quickly and just flipping right to those isolated trees and clumps of weeds and moving along in a pretty expedient pace. And now once we, you know, went to these more of a finesse tactic, we're fishing it considerably slower. And the odd thing is, is we could probably put some other alternate baits on and come back right back to the same area and trigger different fish. Oh, there's one. Oh, not a biggie, I don't think. Not a bad one, though. A fish. Another fish. Come here, buddy. Hard to beat. A trick stick when it comes to catching bass that are sort of inactive. I think more of these have been sold than any other soft plastic on the planet. <laughs> and you look at it, it's just a stick, <laughs> you know. Better one. The real leaper. A little bit better. I thought she was a little better than that. Look, I think it was another fish almost with them. That's still a flipper. Yeah, marginized, marginal flipper with light lines. That's amazing how deadly, yeah, you know, this system is for that finesse bite early in the year. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. So that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins. Well, considering the conditions that we have, which is somewhat adverse with the 25 mile an hour winds, we've got a few bass, some jigging, some finesse fishing, but we're on the bigger and better water. We're gonna move into the back end of the bay here. I think it should still be pretty fishable. We'll see if there's any number of fish still holding in those bays before they come out. We'll see. Got him. I told you, Jim, I couldn't, I couldn't let it go by. Ooh, a double, a double. <laughs> there it is. My first frog bass of the year. I told Jim, you gotta take me into some frog water. We got all these new Terminator frogs. This is a, one of the new uh, popping frog colors. They just added some phenomenal colors. And uh, I, I said, this particular color, I looked at this and I said, I gotta get this on and get bit on it, Jimmy. You don't frog fish in normally in 30, 35 mile God, an hour winds. But I said, take me to a frog spot. So he's got me back in somebody's bays back in here and there's some fish. We are catching some fish here. But my first frog fish of the year, it's starting. It don't get much better than that. I love the frog bite. Ooh, there's one. Oh, big one. Now you're talking. Not too bad, though. We actually have a little bit of weeds in here. We're only in about a foot in the water. It's one thing about this early season fishing. You have the fish doing a lot of, a lot of different areas. Hmm. Starting to get there. Got him. Number two frog bass for the year. Jimmy's bringing me back into frog water, and I'm loving it. You know, t today angling has become so presentation specific, and what I mean by that, a matched rod, reel, and line for the given fishing situation you happen to be fishing. Today, I've been doing a lot of jig flipping, so I'm using a, a Legend Tournament flipping rod. This is a seven foot six, heavy, moderate, fast action rod that's really designed for this presentation. This rod line has been around for a long time. It's the famed St. Croix blue rods, very well known amongst bass anglers as being very high-end rods. But they went through the whole line and sort of like fine-tuned the action, changed some of the modulus and even the mixtures of different materials to make the rods for given fishing situations. There's actually 18 different bait casting rods alone for different fishing situations. They all happen to be frogging and then eight different spinning rods. 
difference, and it does make a difference once you fish with the rods and reels. You know what I mean? When it's matched right, they're really fine-tuned machines. They really are. Ooh. Whoa. Big giant perch. <laughs> I'm getting my frog fix. Not as good as you're catching on a jig fix, but I'm getting my frog fish. You know, and just like rods, uh, reels too, you know, are really fine-tuned for a given fishing situation. This happens to be a, a Daiwa pitch and flip elite reel. It's really designed for this type of application. This is a real high-speed reel. This is an 8.1, but it also has a very narrow uh, uh, spool. Come here, buddy. So it's actually really, very, very hard to backlash once you get this uh, reel tuned. But it, you, what I'm saying is when you get a really matched tackle, balanced equipment, it's amazing how efficient and easy it, it, it makes fishing. No question about it. We are loaded for bear. We got you know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for walleye. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rods on the planet. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these die with drag. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. I got him. Doubles, doubles, doubles. Just a little guy. <laughs> you know. We were talking just a little while ago. What are we gonna call this show? Wait, look at that. Got any idea what we're gonna Whoa. do with this thing? We started with this, we started with that. You know what I think we could call we can call the show making a, a tough day a good day. You know, it is sort of intriguing. You know, we came out, the weather conditions look so uh, negative. And the thing is, as what Al was talking about, it's sort of intriguing. You go just do something different. You know, I've been on this lake one other time for about two hours. So we came over and did a investigation, and it's been sort of a learning experience. Now I want to come back here again. <laughs> you know, when I do these closes, it's usually about something personal and something that I believe the Lord has done in my life. And, uh, and what I'm going to share with you today, I was really torn. Lord, do I really have to share this? You know, this is really special to me. And uh, I was torn. Yes, no, yes, no. And it's like the Spirit of God said, you need to share it because a lot of people are dealing with issues like this and need to hear this from you. A lot of you know that my wife has dealt with a lot of health issues over the years. Well, she went home to be with Jesus, went to heaven about 11 months ago now. The last six weeks were tough, toughest six weeks of my life. We were at Abbott Heart Hospital in Minneapolis, and she was in the intensive care unit. Over the years, she had three valve replacements. She was diabetic, uh, a lot of other issues. And uh, the heart was wearing out again. We had valve problems. There was a lot of things they couldn't do. Yeah, you know, and uh, she started to get really sick really fast. Like I said, I was down there 24 seven with, with her during the COVID crisis. They did let me stay in the hospital from seven in the morning until late at night with her. And then I had to leave. But it was uh, 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 one day after the other, after the other things, the doctors were trying everything on that you can imagine. And uh, uh, after very, near the end of almost like five weeks in there, they wanted to try one more test and she did not want to do this. She was already on pain pills, uh, 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 sleeping about 22 hours a day, very distant much of the time. And uh, uh, at one point, just days be before she went home, she looked at me matter of factly, there was a test that we were supposed to do the next morning she looked at me and said, honey, I can't do this no more. I want to go home to be with Jesus. Take me home so I can go home. Take me out of here. I want to go to my house. 
when she said that to me, what I heard in my heart from the Spirit of God is, Al, it's time. I'm coming to get her, and you got to let her go. Al, it's time. I'm coming to get her, and you got to let her go. At that moment, my prayer went from believing for a miracle, which we've seen so many times in her life over the years. It just went like this. Lord, make it quick and easy. It was days later. She was in our home. Here, I was holding her hand on one side. My boys were holding her hand on the other. When her spirit left her body, she went to heaven. The peace that I have after that took a little bit of time. You can imagine what you went through. But I know and I believe in my heart what the Word of God says, that I will see her again. She's in a new body, a healthy body, living a good life, dancing in the streets of gold in heaven. I believe that with all my heart and that I will see her again. That gives me the peace that surpasses all understanding. And there's a peace that I could deal with any, anything now. Am I still adjusting? Yeah, there's days and things that I adjust to. That's going to go on, on for some time yet. But, but I dealt with it when I seen what had happened. When she was ready, she was ready. Everything just flipped over. And God just, it was a beautiful exit from body into the spirit world to heaven. And brings, that brings me peace that surpasses all understanding. Some of you right now are dealing with similar situations like this. I hope this helps you. Hey, from all of us here at The Edge, have a great fishing season. We'll see you in the water. Got there it. you go. Better now. Another one. Oh, there's a big one yeah, there, Al. There. <laughs> we land these fish, we'll tell you what. Look at that. Are. It's really quite. Quite incredible. It's a pretty, pretty one there, boy. You got a big gal, really a big gal. Topping with 17 pound mono. I need a player, so I got him right here. You there you go. Left. Here you go. Okay. Three, one. Got it. Not a real monster, but we're getting into it. I got to tell you how this day went. We wanted to go do a frog show for a largemouth bass. And uh, it was real slow. Yeah, they weren't hitting the frog. I said, well, let's go catch us some smallmouth, James said. We've had extremely high water this year. So these smallmouth went up all these side creeks and they wanted to get in clear water. And uh, they're getting some pretty skinny water and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish on a lot of bodies of water that make that move. And these fish have moved down from where they were in one of the smaller rivers, and they're now dumping into one of the bigger rivers. And we got in a couple areas here now where a bunch of them are settled. There's a bunch of fish that make this movement at one time. When the water drops, starts falling like it did, these fish make a major move, and we finally hit a mother load, to say the least. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. You know, the one of the real keys to catching fish is ultimately finding fish. Uh, right now, Al and I are fishing in a river, and we have sort of interesting conditions. The water was actually almost like five foot high. It was actually out of the banks. When you look at these trees, you can see the water was four foot higher, and the main river channel is like chocolate milk. Most anglers, whether you be bass, walleye, muskies, pan fishermen, any fish rivers, would say that's a really bad time of the year to fish, but it isn't. If you go with the flow, you got to move with the fish. That's part of it, and water clarity's got a lot to do, do with it. Well, we're going to run down the river here and see if we can find a little bit more clear water, and then we'll tell you the rest of the story. You'll notice, though, right here, when you're looking down in the water, how chocolate milk this water is right here. But you'll notice in the next 30 feet, there's going to be a dynamic change. And what we're doing is we're getting into a feeder river. 
This happens to be a good size uh, feeder river of this larger river. And this actually applies to a wide variety of different fish species. This applies to catfish, it applies to smallmouth bass, walleyes, muskies. All fish make this very, very similar movement when you have extraordinarily high water in a major river shed and you're looking for clear water. I mean, that's the way it is. It's a relatively simple pattern, it really is, because a lot of people really say one of the bane of fishing is high, dirty water. If you're a river fisherman, that's bad. But realistically, it's not if you know where to move to. Oh, look at that one. Oh, there's a big one. Oh, wow. These guys pull hard. <laughs> uh, the afternoon bite is kicking on like it usually does. Come on, buddy. Okay, Al. She's finally showing Whoa. her wares. Come on, yeah. It was sort of a workout. Work. Look at that. It was a workout for Come here, buddy. Look at this. Wow, oh, there you go. Look at that. Another good one. Yeah, look at that. There you go, man. There we go. This is the handiest tool, not only for topwater baits, but uh, for crank, crank baits as, as well. I'm not kidding you, I've absolutely been sold on this thing because it's got this small little hook in there. You can reach down inside the mouth. Smallmouth bass got such a small mouth. And when they come up and inhale, these baits are way down the, the pipe and you, it's sort of hard to get in there with a the plier sometimes. But that, that little tool there, this hook out, the, the gorger is a really ha handy little thing. I'm not kidding you, for a wide variety of different fish. The river here is real muddy. This one that's coming in is clear. And uh, we're sticking in the clear water areas. Smallmouth don't like muddy water. The fish are, they're sight feeders, predominantly sight feeders. You know, you can catch largemouth in muddy water. Smallmouth you can't, that they avoid it like the plague. They'll find the clearest water that they could possibly find. And gather in there, they know where to go. They know where to go. They love clear water. And they like to bite in the middle of the day. If you're fishing for river smallmouths, a good bait to have in the boat. Yeah. And you know what else they like? Ooh. Sun. You see that one? Those are all neat things about smallmouths. So. <laughs> they, they like to yeah, bite in, that. in the middle of the water. day. They, they like Ooh. sun versus overcast. Ooh. And the other thing, they like topwater baits a lot. I just gave you most of the reason why smallmouths are my favorite. Can I add a couple more to it? They like to bite and they like to fight. Pretty good combo with everything, isn't it? This segment is brought to you by Sunset Country, Ontario, Canada. You gotta come visit. Right in here somewhere, there should be, there's a really good current seam in here where you can see where this tree is breaking and there's sort of a slack water point or slack water area right in back of this log jam. A lot of times what the fish will be doing, they'll be just sitting in where right up where the deepest current meets the slack current. Oop, oh, there's one. Oh, the, the big one? No, nice one though. I know one thing, he's a tough one. They never give up. Whoa. They really are an ama amazing sport fish. Wow. <laughs> and also, very, very dangerous with a prostate. Yeah. They're very dangerous. Okay, come here, buddy. Let me get it into the Vulcan grip on them. The frog colored skitter prop. One of my all time favorite top water baits. It's amazing on how dead that little blade is constantly spinning when you're not fishing the bait and it seems like that really attracts them. A lot of times they'll hit the bait after you give it the rip, rip, rip and it's just drifting downstream but that blade is still spinning and it's a great attracting deal for the fish. Got that one, I think that's that big one. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Good one. Better size one there. A better size one, he, one of the nettable models, okay. I like that. Now you're talking, James. Now you're talking. Man, oh man, the afternoon bite is really, really, really kicking in. Look at that, oh boy. Yeah, we came through here earlier this, earlier today for a little while and, you know, we caught some fish, but it was nothing, nothing earth shaking. And we, we decided we're gonna come back through one more time. 
and that happens so often on these big smallmouth. You know, they like hot, humid. Uh, uh, the afternoons a lot of times are better than the daytime, you know, you know, the morning bite. General rule of thumb with these big smallies like this, they like to bite really good, you know, in the middle of the day. They like sunshine. They like humidity like this. And uh, when they get active, there is no better way that I know to catch bunches of the biggest smallmouth in a river or creek system that you're in than throwing a top water like this little baby, the skitter prop. There's, oh, <laughs> now you're talking. <laughs> That's a real leaper. <laughs> That's smallmouth fishing. <laughs> river smallmouth, they, they are acrobats. That a netter? Nope. Nope. Sure make a lot of noise like yeah. one, but. There we go. Come here, buddy. A little bit better one. Come here. One thing, you know, when we're using uh, like these prop baits like this, what's really important with a pretty black one is, believe it or is not, is the line you're fishing. And a lot of times what we prefer to fish is monofilament line where it floats. Like this is a like 14 pound mono, so it keeps it the bait up high in the surface. But not only that, I'm fishing with this uh, uh, Tatula SV. This is an 8.1, real fast gear ratio reel. el has got another one on. And big ones are waking up, Jim. One thing that's really critical, you'll notice my drag is set really pretty soft because these fish so, pull so hard. Not only that, when you set the hook on them, you want to get, give a little bit when they grab the bait. They come up and they blow up on the bait. You let them, let them grab it and drop back down. Then you just lift into them, where you'll notice that we're not really setting the hook really hard on them. When they turn on, they turn on. The, the, the magic bell goes on. They see that top water bait coming. <clears throat> and they, they can't help themselves. <laughs> they got to eat it. They're grow, growing up. The little ones were earlier as the afternoon goes on. They get bigger and bigger. This is such a fun bait to fish. We are loaded for bear. We got You know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rods on a planet. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these Daiwa drags. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. Hope there's another one right there chasing it out. You know, boat control is pretty important in river fishing situations. And you notice what I've been doing a lot. We're in relatively shallow, we're in this feeder river right now. The, Right below the boat, it's only three, four foot of water, primarily sand. And we're casting to any type of uh, current breaks and even the front face of any type of cover that the fish could be potentially sitting in. But what I've been using is these Talon shallow water anchor intermittently. I, nice, I pull up and then we get to a good spot where I, right in here we got like a, a current break in back of this log jam and I just drop the, uh, the uh, talons down just to hold position so we're not having to fight current. I, I know one thing as far as the best tool I've ever, for a river fishing scenario, I guarantee you shallow water anchoring systems like those talons are absolutely amazing. It's not only for like smallmouth bass like this, it's for walleyes, muskies. I use it for all different fish species, but in a river fishing situation, catfish, it's just like, they are really the deal. They really are. We can instantaneously pin the boat, hold position. It seems like this tube, Al, bouncing it out a little bit off the break. One thing that's, you know, when the water's dropping like this was, it's sort of always intriguing to me in the fact that when the water's dropping out, a lot of times what the fish will do is pull off the bank. When the water's pushing up, the fish will get tight on the bank. Right now, what I've been doing is just taking the tube and sweeping it out into this deeper stuff. We've been catching some fish propping up shallower, but some of these little bit deeper edges, well, it's not deeper per se, just off the bank, not on the bank, I should say. Come here, buddy. <laughs> Look at him, he's a pip squeak. <laughs> I got a really pretty stout rod in here. This is it. St. Croix 7.3 Power Finesse. Uh, 
Legerman tournament rod, and it's a really a pretty stout rod for finesse fishing like this. I mean, actually, if you're using a relatively lightweight bait and just sweeping it in front, front of these uh, these log jams, but got them a little bit better. They're so tough in this current. No, I know, aren't they? They're just amazing. Oh, we got off. I came today with only a couple rods for largemouth bass and frogs. And so I'm fishing Jimmy's stuff. Thank goodness he's always got, yeah, you know, his one thing here, he's loaded with rods all the time for anything, for any kind of fish. You know, I'm throwing top water. He's throwing a spinning rod and top water. Yeah, you know, I'm, this is the old, uh, when I grabbed it, I looked at the old, the, the old uh, St. Croix Legend Elite. You know, been here forever. I got a Daiwa Zillion on it. And, and this one, he's throwing a spinning rod. Rod, yeah, you know, we fish all St. Croix rods and, and uh, Daiwa reels. Yeah, you know, so we're fortunate we fish with some of the best equipment in the business. And you know, we mix it up and we got all kinds of different rods that we use for different kinds of things. But this is the same St. Croix rods. This is the old time, oldie but goodie, the Elite Series. And I, it never gets old, I love it. <laughs> and a Daiwa Zillion, well, it speaks for, speaks for itself. You know, right now we've been catching the majority of the fish where I'm just uh, drifting that light tube and Al's been catching them on this, the uh, skitter prop. But when you look on the deck of the boat, we have a variety of different baits here. We got uh, a Terminator frog, you got a little uh, Rapala Rocco crankbait, I got a prop bait, I got a swim bait over here, and a spinner bait for when you're fishing uh, heavy wood cover because we're fishing so many varied habitats when we get on the rock flats we're picking up the rocko if you're up in the wood you're throwing a spinner bait if you're you know some of these deeper current seams the tube is a really good option and the Ooh, frog big, the big, frog, big, frog big, sort of works big, or the big, top big, water works everywhere big, like that big, one big, there big fish is that a good one yeah yeah real big fish yeah biggest fish of the day I put the brakes on. <laughs> I mean, she's a she's a big gal. I don't even get Mr. Clammy out for just to see how how, how I, I, I don't I don't think it's that big. You don't think it's that no, big? No, you just haven't been catching the real big one. Ooh, that's a whopper. Oh, yeah, that's what I yeah. said, Paula. <laughs> that's what I said. Whoop! Whoa! <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm telling you, these are. That is a big, big. Bit. Wow, that is a biggie. Yeah. And we could use her. Uh. This is like, you know, this we're in a tournament right now and you gotta land this one. This she is a big, big thing. What if I told this you that a big it, it is small would you see the sucker? Whoop, whoop. I, I don't want to lose it. I'm, 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 Believe it or not, you know, in the past, I actually caught one of the largest smallmouths in the Mississippi River. Why is this fish so Right tight? down down here. Me, it's river smallmouth. I had a smallie like this for a while. Yeah. Okay. Wait, it's a real king tub. Yeah, I, I mean, she's a big, big, big fish. Mm -hmm. I can see the bait in the corner of her mouth. Oop, there, come here. Oh. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I know. I know. Wow. I've seen that before. In this current, it's amazing. I, I mean, I mean, and I don't want to lose her, man. No. I, I want you to see the fish. <laughs> yeah, these are the real aggravators when you're fishing tournaments and you hook these guys. It's sort of, they're not like, like largemouth. You roll them over and reel them in. <laughs> the river smallmouths like this, they're serious tough. I mean, they are tough, bo they're tough boys. Ooh, uh. Bummer. Now that was an aggravation. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. Well, that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins. Yep, you know, a couple more chunks here. Oh, Al, that's a big one there. Oh. Oh no. You got him? Yeah. Oh, look at, oh, he had, oh, do you know what that was? Uh, 
There was two of them. Wait, there was two. Well, I there got was this a, one. The other one yeah, might the, be that did one. Did you have both of them hooked? No. Oh, I was going to say, it looked like it. Yeah, hope he's still there. The other's one with him. I'll, I'll yeah. keep him double up, double oh, up. I got, you got him. him? Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's been known to happen. Yeah, what? <laughs> and he got the big one. Yeah, I did too. Huh? <laughs> yeah, like that. I got the nice one. He got the big one. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. We got one of it. Got Mine's his, jumping, got, yours jump. Got okay, his, you got to get yours. His buddy. Here you go, Al. Where is he at? I, 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 I'm, what? you left a, a line what? in a... There you go. Oh, 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 How do you like how I do that? I like that a lot, <laughs> but <laughs> hang on of, a minute. What? I, hang on a minute. That's sort of a mess. Uh, a bit of pandemonium. And you got your fish? Yeah, I do. Uh, I still do. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, wow! This guy here. There you go. I, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is a real fiasco we're in here right now. I got one rod out of here. I got this other bait in the net. But that happens when you get it all of a sudden an explosion. <laughs> this guy, this guy here just does not know when to stop. Come here. There. You need oh. a net on him, yeah. now you got it. Yeah, that'll, that'll make things far, far and away easier. Come here, come here, come here. There you go. Okay. There we go. It's a real yeah. ship of fools full, full here. This is, this was a bit of a fiasco. I thought you, I thought we were professional fishermen, not leaving lures hanging in the side of the boat, trapped in the net, getting this. Yours considerably better than mine. Yeah. It was a good call to come back through here, dig out, experiment. We followed the fish out from where they were. We're in a run here where a bunch of them are heading to the main river, and it's Katie by the door. They're coming in all shapes and sizes, and we got to regroup. There's a few more to catch. Hey, I get lots of emails on a regular basis. I just want to read this one to you. And it was titled, True Inspirational Humor, True Story. A longtime viewer of your fishing shows and one who truly appreciates your inspirational endings to your shows, I thought I would share this true story. A colleague of mine was stricken when in his mid-50s with a very strange nerve-based illness that after years of treatments and therapies continued to degrade his mobility, his mobility until eventually he lost the use of his legs and generally became depressed about his failing condition. Since he was unable to do many of the general home maintenance projects any longer, most of the work had to be hired out. As he sat in his wheelchair one morning feeling bad and a bit depressed, he got a text message on his phone. The message was short and simple. Jesus will be there shortly. Shocked by the message, my friend started thinking, the end is near, and, and Lord, I'm not ready to go yet, he thought. What will I say if Jesus actually comes for me? Well, his mind was put to ease when later that day there was a knock on his door. It wasn't Jesus. It was Jesus, pronounced Jesus, a Hispanic worker there to do some roof repair. Needless to say, my friend was relieved to know he still had time to finish his divinely assigned task here on Earth. A little bit of humor, but some serious note behind the humor. When our time comes, and it's going to come for all of us, do you have the peace of God in your heart because of the shed blood of Jesus? That when it's time to check out, you're going to go to heaven? Something to think about this week. Hey, from all of us here at the Edge, you have a great fishing season. We'll see you in the water. Got him. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on the board, Jim. I've seen a white tail. Ah, an eater. Oh, an just, eater. You gotta flip that little rascal, or do you want him in, into the whole netting action? I'm getting the net out. You know what? You can do that. I can flip this okay. one. That's 
hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah, I'm seeing some of them on the mega and, and, and you're working them. First fish is a little fish, huh? Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. In our part of the world, in the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes states, our two favorite months of the year to fish is the month of June and the month of October. October Absolutely. is trophy time. That's when you're fishing for monsters. The month of June is everything goes. I mean, every, everything is biting and biting good. The whole month of June, you wake up in the morning, say, oh, I want to go crappie fishing today, or smallmouth, or largemouth or walleyes, or muskies, whatever. They're all biting, all biting. It's a fantastic month. And then what do you do next? Where do you go anywhere? You look at the wind. Last couple of years, the wind has been absolutely horrendous. But wind can be good, too. We looked at, at a rare moment the next two days in South Dakota is fishable. We chose to go to South Dakota to do a little walleye fishing. And uh, we heard the bite is pretty good here. And the bite in the Dakotas, well, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Dakota fishery. It's a lot different than some of the Midwestern uh, 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 mesotrophic lakes that we fish. But there's some phenomenal fishing in these prairie lakes. And we're on the fishing, all the water that we have spent over the years is on the east side okay. of South Dakota. There and there's a whole bunch of great lakes here. Great fishing opportunities. And walleyes are one of them. Boy, did she come up. I was way up there, way up there. Maybe we haven't, ooh, look at that. Look at that, ooh. Mm. Strikes again to Slim Minnow. Pretty good one, pretty good one. Little bit, a little bit skinny, James, but not that bad. Pretty nice fish. Wow. Bigger or same? Small mouth. <laughs> You no. got smallmouth on the brain. No, no, no it's a, it's a wild walleye. This is tremendous, uh, this, the base of the forage uh, food base in here are these freshwater shrimp. And it feeds the perch, it feeds all the uh, bullheads, it feeds everything up the food chain. And that's why the, the tremendous growth rates in these fish. The interesting thing is, it's r really odd. You don't, you know, well, a six pounder is a big one here. Uh, but there's oodles and oodles of, you know, of this size fish up to two to three, four pounders, you know, but there's a lot of them, but they don't have the tendency to, they don't have the really top end growth you see in the, uh, you know, like in Minnesota where we got a lot of tulipy based lakes or deep water forage lakes. Got, got him. him. Good, good eyeball. Yeah. Eh, not real good, but not no. bad. Healthy one. I can't, yeah, I, can't, I don't know oh, if I can. there's another one. Would it? Yes. You got yours? Yes. Mark. Mark. Mark, 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 Waypoint. You know, on the way out here, I was actually reading some different things from the USGS, and, and what it was, it was talking about the, the water levels in, the, in these lakes, and it's, a lot of these lakes are at an all-time high. And it's sort of intriguing, what happens is, and they were talking about the perch and the wildlife boom, and what happens when you get that really high water years, like we have over the last number of years, but we have a really high water year this year, you have tremendous uh, booms in populations of fish. And like over the next three or four years from now, all of a sudden these lakes are gonna be loaded with giant perch. I mean, all of a sudden these lakes, even these uh, uh, lakes, these little shallow water lakes that are, you know, little swamp lakes will have, you know, 12, 14 inch perch out there. We've come out here and done a, a bunch of ice fishing in them, and it's, it's sort of an amazing thing because these lakes normally do not freeze out for some reason. They don't get that much uh, snow cover, and a lot of them don't you know, see winter co, you know, even though they're relatively shallow water lakes. I mean, these are the kind, uh, kind of fish that people come out here for, the big eaters like this. This segment is brought to you by Big Bite Baits, designed to bring the big bite to your line. You know, a lot of these Dakota lakes are what we call prairie lakes. Uh, there's fish shallow all year long. Most of, many of these lakes aren't, you know, 12 feet deep, 15 feet deep. You know, naturally you have some a little bit, a li little bit deeper, a little more structure in them. But generally speaking, they're shallow water fish 
Ooh. All the time, time. The, the times that I fished her over the years, there was always shallow water fish in and around the weeds. And, and they're jig fish, you can catch them, lipless crankbaits and then shad wraps at different times. You know, but there's always some shallow water weed fish. And the fish like we just caught a couple of here, that's the bread and butter of why people come to the Dakotas. You know, to pack them in a freezer and they're, they're perfect eaters. And like Jim said, a, a 26 incher out of a lot of these lakes is a really good fish. Yeah, 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 you know, that's a, a real good fish, but boy, you got a lot of fish that go, you know, 18 to 23. Just amazing bodies of water. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you're a walleye fisherman, yeah, you know, and you never came to this area of uh, eastern South Dakota, yeah, you got to give it a try. It's really fun. There's loads of lakes here. We're on one of the bigger lakes, but there's a lot of smaller lakes you can beat wind in. You can fish these lakes a lot of different ways. You know, jigs and spinners and are, are really a mainstay here, live bait rigging. But the population of fish is staggering, staggering when you come here and see it. Really is amazing, a fish per, per acre. The in interesting thing is, is, you know, throughout the summer that these fish that Al was saying they never really go deep I mean he, even when the water's in this you know high 70s 80 degrees and you get on these shallow water walleye bites you can't believe how how tough tough these little runts, <laughs> runts are I mean these guys are tough you know what I mean that's a better one come here he's a real nice that's a that's a good one there come here buddy look at that guy look how healthy that that animal is that's a good one there and look how he just launched it you can see he brought a little bit of his home out there. In this particular lake, there's really a lot of uh, big monstrous uh, weed beds as well as the structure. Man, buddy, boy, that's a little fetzo, fetzy. You can see what we've been fishing, a lot of these uh, primary points offshore right now. The fish are sort of transitioning, coming out of the shallow water here. We're in here the second week of June, but look at all the structure on this lake. I mean, it is just like a minefield of underwater structures all the way across this whole region. And when you look across how big it is, I mean, there are literally, I don't even know how many spots out here. And so you could, I mean, you could go through it. We're, Al and I are just jumping from point to point to point, fishing wherever the wind is blowing in on these, each uh, underwater structure we're fishing. You can see right here, the wind is coming from the west and it's blowing right into the tip of this point. And that's where we've been. You can see where a lot of our coordinates are at. They're just not on those positions. We're fishing two different kinds of baits. Jimmy's throwing a boot tail, big bite boot tail, and, and I'm throwing a big bite bite a new new bait called called the, a four inch slim minnow, and it's a split tail. You might ask yourself the question: When do you throw a split tail versus a boot tail? Usually, when we first start the morning off and we're out on the water, one guy starts with one and one starts with the other. And generally, by the end of the day, and you'll see that they want something snapping a lot faster and you want it to get a reaction bite. That's where the, 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 the slim minnow comes in. On, a, on that flat aspirin head moon eye jig, that thing just, it snaps like this. When you see it in the water and it rolls, the flat part of it rolls, where the boot tail grabs water and it goes like this. And it's a slower dropping bait. So this can be fished much faster, has more tri triggering appeal than the boot tail. But if I had to give you one advice, I'm gonna go back to what I said. You got two people on the water, always start with somebody with a boot tail and somebody throwing a split tail like the new Slim. Well, that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins. We are loaded for bear. We got You know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rides on a planet. Got him, Jim. Pretty nice one. I netter. Yeah, you know, I got a question for you. Do you think color makes a difference for walleyes? 
anybody that knows anything says, well, of course. Of course it does. And uh, we did a lot of work with these new colors. And uh, as a walleye angler, many of you that are, you know, hot colors, really hot colors. You've seen them in spinners. You've seen them in crankbaits. You, you, you speed, now we're putting them in jigs. I mean, really things that, colors that have been proven in a hard bait line to catch walleyes. Well, we brought them in and had them brought into the soft bait line. And walleyes, they like colors too, big time. You know, there's a wide variety of ways to present this bait. You'll notice that we're doing some amount of casting and popping the bait back or slow re reeling the retrieve in the case of with the suicide shad here. But you can also fish it just like a live bait rig. And I do that a lot depending on the wind conditions. What I'll do is just take the bait in eight to 10 foot of water, you throw it out in back of the boat and you slip drift and do control drifts down the edge and just sort of feeling the bait is sort of walking it along the bottom. As far as equipment goes, this is a St. Croix Icon snap jig rod. This is 6'8", medium power, extra fast action. And this is actually tailor made for this presentation technique. You know, so many rods and reels the, these days are actually designed for a specific presentation. As far as line, I have 10 pound text, Suffix 832, 10 pound test with a fluorocarbon leader, an Invisalign fluorocarbon leader. I have an FG knot right here. And then I go about four feet of eight pound test fluoro and that goes right to your, to the bait. But it's really sort of a fine-tuned uh, rod and reel for this technique, no question about that. This is the rod of choice for the, doing this. You know, what's really important about any type of fishing presentation is actually balanced tackle. And for this, with my rod, I actually have a Daiwa 2000 Regal reel. Now this has a really fine-tuned drag. You can, it's got that real high-pitched click on there it's because you're using relatively light line. You need a, need a good drag. But the, what the biggest thing is is the size of the reel balances nicely with the rod. The either a 2,000 or a 2,500 is the right size of reel for this type of presentation. You know, it, the wind is blowing like crazy, and I'm slip drifting with James some of these spots. See that? That was thick. That's that's mega live. The end. We're right on the base of those weed lines. You watch it. All of a sudden, you'll see a big fish. All of a sudden, that's we're seeing them. They're suspended from those pieces, and you'll see those bigger marks right at the bottom. And I'm hovering right on them with my trolling motor. The weed line's right here. Right, and, and I'm right following right exactly on the edge of it. And you'll, you'll see fish. You, you watch it, you'll see some swimming up just out of it. And you're learning, I'm learning a lot to do on how I'm using this for walleyes. Walleyes too, and th these are fish in the weeds, so they got, the, you'll, you'll see them swimming out along the edge of the weeds. There's weed walleyes in the Dakotas in the shallow lakes like this all year long. Yeah, this lake has got some deep structure, but, but you can always, always, always come spring, summer, fall, open water and catch weed walleyes. And today we're catching some fish right up on top in four feet of water, and then some fish dragging right along the very, very scrape in the base of the weeds. I'm watching, I'm, I got it on, on auto on here, going into some pretty heavy wind with my Minn Kota, and I just, I got everything set up on auto, got him. Good one again. A little bit better than normal. Once you learn how to use that Minn Kota, and uh, you, you know, it, where you got it on constant and you're working big waves like this, where boat control is everything, yeah, 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 you know, that Minn Kota in this kind of wind. Uh, I mean, we've been running them for years, and it, I mean, my confidence and comfort with this trolling motor, I can't say enough about, about, about it. We've been with them most of our entire careers. And you get in big weather, bad weather, you travel all over the country, yeah, you know, to fish, you're in Canada, some very remote places. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, 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 they, there's no issues with them. They're bulletproof. You know, a lot of walleye fishing uh, is all about boat control and your ability to, you know, control drift. And we're pulling along the edges of some of these spots. And now Al has turned the boat sideways and he's slipping down. 
and it's usually what happens, we'll hit a fish and they'll hit spot lock, which is, you know, obviously a, a huge tool for walleye fishing because it all of a sudden just pins you right on the spot where you just caught a fish. And generally, you know, as you see, I saw, we'll catch a number of fish from that given spot. You know, that's one thing about the spot lock feature, what it does, you know, and wind varies, you know what I mean? Right now it's sort of gusty, so it's changing. Sometimes it's blowing, sometimes it's, you know, it'll back off a little bit. But what the trolling motor does is because it's a GPS based system, the trolling motor actually has a GPS sensor in there and it's positioning based on its location. It enables you to really stay on an accurate location, even in really big wind. We use it for in so many different various conditions. It's amazing, not only for walleye fishing, but for any different fishing situation or a lot of different fishing situations throughout the course of a year. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these die with drag. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. Ooh, got it, Jim. Good one. Yeah, it got a little, it, it feels like you got some shoulders to them. Yeah, nice one, nice one. Okay. Definitely a nice one. Okay. Oh. It's a little sporty, it's a yeah. little sporty. A little better one, there, yeah. Go, oh, 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 hang on, hang on. This is a, 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 a bit a step up from the mother one, James. Yeah. Whoa, let me give you, there you go. Oh, look at that. Oh, I got, oh. My back is really sore, so every time I catch a fish, I gotta sit down. <laughs> I guess it go, it goes, nice fish, huh? These are nice chunks. This is bread and butter fishing here, you know, in this part of the world, and in many parts of the These are nice fish. Really nice fish by anybody's standards. I mean, if you fish many of Minnesota's and Wisconsin's classic walleye lakes, with the exception of the Great Lakes and the rivers that fish those Great Lakes, you know, fish like this are, are really, really welcome. You, you, you know, where you're catching a lot, a lot of fish. You, you know, a lot of these smaller lakes, you, you know, it's all relative. And there's some lakes just don't, that, you know, in this part of the world, we said it a couple different times. You know, 26 incher is a big fish, but boy, oh boy, there's a lot of these, these 18, 19, 20, 21, 22s. Yeah, you know, and, and they're just plain, plain fun to catch. You know, plain fun to catch. It's all relative, all relative. And when you can set the hook on so many fish, well, it's tough to beat, especially doing jigs. Hey, the other morning when I got up, I got a beep on my phone. I pick it up, look at it, and it says, good morning from Apple News. The first images from the James Webb Space Telescope showing the deepest views of the universe ever captured. Then it goes on to read. The first image from NASA's Webb Telescope is our deepest view of the universe. The newly released full color images highlight a stunning collection of ancient galaxies and heralds in a new age for astronomy. After a million mile journey into space, NASA's newest flagship observatory, the James Webb Space Scope, has captured its first suit of full color images of the universe. As seen through the instrument's sharp infrared eye, that little patch of populated is populated by swirling, glowing, gorgeous galaxies, some of which existed more than 13 billion years ago when the universe was still a toddler. And then it goes on to talk about how important a find like this is. Every time I read something like this, I wonder how people can look at the world around us and look at space, the magnitude of space, and believe that this, all of a sudden, for no rhyme or reason, just 
popped up. Just a pop-up. No, nothing. Starts with some goo and it led to the magnitude of space and the world and the earth we live in. Blows my mind that, that they can't say the word God or create it. It's so simple to me. How clear it is. I went, I got to go first of all as I always do. The book of knowledge. Tells you everything you got to know about anything. And it's in the very, very beginning. The very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis, the first thing it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Duh. <laughs> is that pretty clear? Pretty simple like the word of God always is? Now let's go a little bit further. Let me go down to Romans 120. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God's word is always so clear, so to the point, it addresses everything, everything. Hey, from all of us here at the edge, you have a great fishing season. We'll see you on the water. There's fish all over up here. There's one. Didn't take long. No. Like there's fish all over up here. Feels like a good one too, Ty. New net? I think it will be a netable model. Nice. We like those Tough kind of customer, models. Tough customer, yeah. Yeah. Little rock here on top and yeah, they really are tough customers. Ooh, Beautiful that's one. That's a good one. Oh, that's a really good one, Jim. Sweet. Nice work. All right. It's a good start. Oh, cool, yeah. Got it? Yep. There we go. Excellent. 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 What a fun mission that Ty and I are on. We are in what many would consider to be the far north, northern Manitoba. We're staying at Viking Lodge on the Cranberry Chain of Lakes, and it's our first morning out, one of our first spots. Bingo Bangle, Canadian gold, right there. So this is going to be a fun trip. We're going to primarily target walleyes, but the system has lake trout, it's got northern pike, and of course lots of walleye. So I think uh, this is going to be a fun couple days catching lots of beautiful fish like this. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. North of the 53rd parallel is the vast top half of the province of Manitoba. Untamed wilderness with countless lakes and rivers define the sprawling landscape. Its signature species are northern pike, lake trout, arctic grayling, and of course, walleye. Recognized as Manitoba's official provincial fish, the walleye is the most sought after species within the province. And one of the reasons we've driven 500 miles north of the border to Viking Lodge. In operation since the 1950s, it's a well-established camp located at the headwaters of the Grass River system on First Cranberry Lake. From the dock, you have access to 52 miles of northern pike, lake trout, and walleye water to explore. There we go. Got one? That's your final you now, Jer, huh? What'd you get him on? Jig of plastic, if you can imagine that. One of the most versatile baits out there for walleyes. I think this is a nicer one, maybe? It's tough to tell, there's some good fighters out here. Sweet, nice fish, just average is great. <sighs> Take that average all day. Look at that beauty, huh? You can get to find an average sized walleye like that. That's a lot of fun to catch. So Jared and I were using all different kinds of baits to, to catch walleyes today. And even when you're talking about jigs, Jigs with plastics, let me get this one back real quick. You're talking about jigs, you got jigs and plastics, jigs and minnows, you got hair jigs, but even jigs themselves, like Jer is using a little bit lighter jig with a, with a, with a soft plastic like this from Big Bite as well. And he's, he was just swimming his along. I'm using a little bit heavier. I'm doing more of a, a, a snap jigging and then swimming along that way too. They're both equally effective, 
And it's just, you gotta find out what those fish want. It seems like they want it both ways right now. And bam. Jeez, huh? just like it's swimming. Yeah. You know, there's a number of options when it comes to, of course, walleye fishing, but hands down, the number one option is the old jig. You just can't beat it. And this is a jig in a plastic here. And we've got a couple baits on the deck right now. The first one, of course, being the jig, but we're also fishing the jig and wrap, the jig and shadow wrap. And when you get in rocky stuff, you gotta have the jig at the ready. Whoa. But when you're fishing a little more sand and that kind of stuff, it's definitely worth having the, uh, the jig and wraps. So, boom. Right there, that's that big bite. Uh, Slim Minnow and that Sensation deal, Sensation. We prototyped this stuff last year and absolutely kicked the snot out of the, the big walleyes on this. They absolutely love it. So one of those things is super glued on there. It's all you need. There we go. There's a walleye jar. It actually feels pretty decent, but it's tough to tell. They seem like they're real good fighters in this lake. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good fish. Netable? I think so. Yeah, why not? We got the net on the deck. Thank you, sir. Gotcha. Appreciate you. Well, that was really cool. You know, like Jared was saying, you definitely need to have a bunch of different baits on the deck. When we first got out here, it was pretty windy. Look at that guy. That's a beautiful Manitoba walleye. Seemed like it laid down. We got into some rocks, and we're using, you know, a jig and plastic really is a finesse jig, uh, presentation. These fish are really reacting to that. Good one. Catch a bunch more. There she goes. This segment is brought to you by Wavy Label Eyewear. Backed by a lifetime warranty, we see what others don't. Oh, that was awesome. I just watched my line jump. Bam! This one was on the jigging shadow wrap. It's kind of a, you know, when you look at that series of glide baits, it's interesting to me. In the wrap of the lineup, you've got the jig and wrap, which is, of course, the most famous. The flat jig, another great bait for fishing, you know, it's quite a bit deeper. And then this is the newest lineup to it. This is the jig and shadow wrap. It's, they, they all have different actions. And this one's got more of like a hang and a glide to it. You know, Tough. been pretty darn, pretty darn effective. All right, there you go, walleye. There you go, buddy. Bam, thank you. Show you this walleye, awesome fish. Boy, just a great size up here, huh? Oh, whoa, that's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> So as I was talking about the family of, you know, this would really be considered a glide bait is what it's called now. We've got the jig and wrap, the flat jig, we've got the snap wrap, and then this is the newest one, like I said, the, the jigging shadow wrap, and they are not all the same bait. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, you know, you just get this glide bait and they're all the same. Well, they're not. They have different fall rates, they move differently, and the shadow wrap jig that I'm fishing right now, it's got a couple advantages for this type of water. One. We're throwing up right now into like 12 to 16 feet of water on top of rocks. It doesn't have the front hook like the jigging wrap has. It can often get snagged. And additionally, it falls a bit slower. It's not as dense for its size as a jigging wrap or a flat jig, which are all lead. This has got more plastic on it. And it's got that nice little hang. The sides are flat. So when the bait comes up, it just hangs on its side for a split second and then falls. And I found this to be a really, really great add-on to your you know, collection of glide baits. And so right now for the shallower, not super bouldery water, this has been a, a really great bait to have up here. So got great purchase with the big hook in the back and then double split rings on the bottom to prevent the fish getting leverage. So definitely worthwhile having a few of these in the boat. Oh, I got one. Well, it's really fun when you can open your tackle box up and pretty much catch a walleye at every single bait that you've been throwing. You got this one on the jig and wrap, which is actually one of my favorite baits to fish for walleyes. Well, that's a nicer fish. I'm gonna get nice one. Yeah, for that one, I think. Ooh, that's Ate a it. One. Well, that's a really oh, great man. fish, Oh, Look at that, huh? Look at that. Woo, wow, stocky. Nice fish. Stocky fish. So let me show you the rod that we're using to catch these fish with this technique. 
And this is actually a, a Legend Tournament Walleye Series jig and wrap rod. So it's a specifically for jig wrap fishing for that technique. So uh, St. Croix has got a, a few other lines of rods in their, in their lineup. Besides this Legend Tournament Walleye, they've got the Icon Series. They've got the Avid Walleye Series. So when you're talking about this, this rod in particular, it's ergonomically designed from the handle to the guides to the power of the blank. So if you look at this handle, it's perfectly designed for jig wrap fishing when you have your whole hand in front of the reel seat. And the reason I do that, number one, you get good leverage, but it also limits the fatigue in your wrist, arm, and your elbow. Now this particular jig wrap rod is a seven foot one, medium power, moderately fast action. So the length of the rod is extremely important when you're ripping that jig and wrap, you usually have some slack in your line, and that length of that rod picks up that line slack really quickly. Now the medium power is great because you got the nice backbone, when you're talking about the action, if you look at the bend in that rod, it goes further back in the blank, which is important when you're talking about jigging wraps. If you look at the hooks on that, they're really small. There's not a lot of real estate to drive that hook into the fish's mouth. So to have that cushion on there, you don't pull hooks out of their mouth when you're fighting those fish and they're making those big runs. Yes, they are. They are walleye. <laughs> they are walleye, Ty. Oh, Just yes. a great average, isn't it? It's a nice fish. Just gotta sneak in and grab the net. Thank you, sir. Yep. Wow, that's a good one. It's a really nice fish. Here. Nice. It's nice. You just catch so many of them. It's nice than like, you think. Oh, it's another one. It's another one. It's another one. Popped off another jig and shadow wrap fish. That's a great bait. I'm telling you what, for the shallower water, what an awesome tool. Look at that, unbelievable. It's been really fun, you know, surprisingly, this, um, this is trout water here, there's lake trout in this lake. And I would think, you know, it's, it's middle of August right now, you'd think that the fish would be in like 25 to 35 feet. But we've been catching most of our fish, I would say in, what would you say, Ty, like 12 to 20 has been yep. really the hot spot. Pretty much all These of fish them. In, in this clear water, they'll be right up there. So get this one back and get a couple more. We're great, great. So that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. Do you want to be able to see in the water? The adventure begins. We are loaded for bear. We got You know, fights. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rides on a planet. Bang, 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 bang. All right. Oh. I got him right underneath the boat. That was super cool. I watched him come up and just bam. Bingo, bingo. I'm liking that shadow wrap, aren't they? They are, yeah. You know, if you're, you've seen it where, you know, somebody's fishing an eighth ounce jig and then somebody's fishing a quarter ounce jig and the, the drop speed makes a big difference yep. in the jig weights you're fishing, it's almost the same thing, you know, with the, the jig and wrap versus the shadow wrap. And right now, I, I think the same thing. I think it's this. Slightly slower drop speed. It has a different action than the jig and wrap, and they seem to be liking it. Oh, it's just like another one of those, you know, four pound walleyes that you just catch every stinking cast. Just don't even net them anymore. All right, yeah, just don't even net these things anymore because they're just one after the other. Yeah, huh? Super cool fish, aren't they? There we go. Finally, hooked up. Almost a double. Almost a double. Good one? Ah, they're all good, I think. It's really interesting. I mean, what we do in this boat is we always have multiple baits hooked up. Gary's running the jig and shadow wrap, and I'm running the jig and wrap right now. It seems like he's out producing the jig and wrap, and yesterday I was out producing with the jig and wrap, so just the, the mood of the fish is always changing from day to day and from even throughout the day so it's always a good thing to have multiple baits hooked up we got jigging shadow wraps we got jigging wraps we've got jigging plastic we got a number of different presentations get him back bam just like that the line just straightened out that was super <laughs> cool that was super cool that's where the high vis line really comes into play when you're fishing these slack line applications like the jig and wrap or the shadow wrap it's so nice to see it so this is 10 pound 
Suffix 832, this is kind of my go-to line for a lot of spinning reel applications. And then I've got it, got the 832, and then I've got a little swivel right here, and then that goes to 12-pound fluorocarbon, and 12 is just a nice, uh, nice pound test for this, this type of stuff when you're fishing around the rocks and whatnot. There we go. Another nice walleye. Woo! All right, so yeah, with the with the leader, you don't want it to be too terribly long, and that's just simply for casting. So I've got probably 18 inches to two feet on here, and then that little rolling swivels the the program for it. Another really key piece of equipment for this deal is is of course the reel. Now I'm fishing a this is a Daiwa Ballistic MQ, a super sweet reel. It's got the big gear as the main frame, but one thing Daya was done with their spinning reels, which is pretty cool, is you'll see some of them that are labeled XH. And that's a high speed reel. So most spinning reels are typically geared at like a 4.7, but Daiwa actually has spinning reels that are geared faster, which is you know something that's been traditionally only in bait casting equipment. And that's really big for the slack line fishing like this, because I'm watching the bait fall, and the last fish I caught, I saw it jump. But at 2,500, I can pick up line almost as fast as I could with say a 4,000 or a 3,000 size reel. So you're able to pick up that slack really quick and then bam, get tight on the fish. So if you're doing these slack line presentations, jerk bait fishing, jig and wrap fishing, look for the reels that have the XH on the back of them because they really are a useful tool for this. Ty, there's a whole pile of them, right? I just missed one. I just missed one? Yeah. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. Dude, that's what I'm talking about, these Daiwa drags. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. Got him, huh? That was cool. I watched them, I thought it was bait, and then I kind of watched them. They must not have seen it, but with the live, you can actually see the fish behave. So they're up like a foot off the bottom, and then all of a sudden they all ran down to the bottom. I was like, oh, those are walleye. And they're big walleye. Nice Look one, at that huh? sucker, holy cow. That's a great big one, Ty. Oh, nice, good job, Jitter. I'll net it for you. And almost a disaster. <laughs> Putting my line wrapped around the rod tip. Cool, thank you, sir. Oh, it popped right off. Yeah, that's great. All right, I can't say enough about this jig and chatter wrap. This has definitely become one of my favorites. Again, it's another you know tool to have in the in the toolbox. It behaves way differently than the you know than the jig and wrap does, and I tend to fish it just slightly different. With the jig and wrap, I like to really snap it and this is almost more of like a, a slower pull and lift and then Ooh. letting it glide back down who tied just missed one but it's awesome for the shallower stuff i really really like it for that like 12 to 20 feet it just seems like it's a magical bait in that zone in love with it and it's been catching a lot of fish like this right man this lake is absolutely jam-packed with these fish what a fantastic fantastic spot this is Woo. Fish in heaven, baby. Let's get this guy back. You know, every year I accumulate some emails that I keep on file that I think would be really, really good to do a close like this on. Well, I'm gonna read you one that I just got a few days ago, actually. Not that many days ago. And I tried to reach back to the gentleman uh, four different times and uh, you'll know why he didn't respond immediately. Ironically, he sent me an email back this morning, and I couldn't believe it when, when I seen it. I'm gonna converse with him. We're gonna have a phone conversation here next couple days after four o'clock. You'll, you'll know more after I read this to you. I've watched your show since I was a kid. Having grown up with a religious faith shoved down my throat, I became agnostic. But I always listened to the prayer and your thoughts at the end of the show. 
I've heard your testimony about your wife's health issues and how God in prayer got you through. My wife, only 46 years old, is suffering from liver and kidney failure. She's very sick and on dialysis. She's been in the hospital for two months now. I also have three children at home and we are all taking this very hard. I began to pray. I haven't done that since high school. I'm a realist. My wife may never come home. At the same time, I feel she needs more than doctors and hospitals. My question is how is your faith so strong? I'm falling apart mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. I guess I'm looking for answers and I'm very afraid. I feel I need to get close to God, but I also have anger towards everyone. I'm on the fence. I want to believe a miracle will happen, but I'm so negative about her condition. So I'm crying out to you to, as a man of deep conviction. This is why I'm reaching out. I don't trust those preachers or priests. I'm asking for some advice and prayers. Am I praying right? Is God real? Does he hear me? I'm so depressed and my head is spinning. I'm a hypocrite for turning to God when things are bad, turning my back on him when things are good. If this message gets to you, please pray for us. I know you can relate. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. Anything will help. Tight lines. Think you had a tough week? <laughs> How about a tough couple weeks? Those are kind of stories that really touch your heart but they're happening to people all over the world on a daily basis. I haven't had an opportunity to talk with him yet. We, we just touched base finally this morning before I'm doing this close. And uh, uh, I'm thinking, what can I share with them? All I can do is share from my heart, for, and we have a lot in common in what he has here. What he said here, I got a lot in common with the whole thing. I can share with him from my personal experience with my wife, business, life in general, you know, the ups and downs, the challenges that we all face. Encourage him, don't run from God, run to God, come to him. And I could see the way he's searching right now. The spirit of God is talking to him. He's look, am I praying right? I want to know, please tell me something. God's going to answer that cry out. He's going to answer that. I don't know what part I'm going to play in this, but I'm going to know, I know for sure that I'm going to be a nucleus of making this happen. I can't wait to talk to him. This might be an ongoing conversation for months ahead to help walk him through this. But I know that the Spirit of God is knocking on his door right now because he does love him, he does care about him and his entire family tough days. You think you had a tough week, like I said? There's people that are dealing with stuff that you can't even imagine, and this is a pretty good example of it. Hey, pray for me. Say a prayer for me that I help this guy through this. Hey, from all of us here at The Edge, you have a good, safe fishing season. We'll see you on the water. Boy, there's a big one. Got him. Yeah? That didn't take long. No. First drop. No. Big, Big walleye. walleye. Look at that thing there. Look Ooh. at that. Wow. That's a good one for the first. What do you think about him? That's a that's well, how do you right like size. What if I told you we, we actually started fishing about 15 minutes ago? <laughs> I don't even think that much. <laughs> Here, we'll, we'll get it. We got to get this fish off. That's a, that's a beauty. That's a big one. There. Come here, buddy. Wow. Beautiful fish. Look at that. What do you think about that? That's cool. We'll get her back in the water. That fish came out of pretty pretty deep. We want to get her back pretty pretty quickly. Wow. There we go. You know, right now Troy and I are at Sunset Country, Ontario. We're staying at a lot Five Lakes Lodge on Gull Rock Lake. And uh, what we want to talk about is trophy fishing opportunities in Canada. You know, we're up here right now, it's the second week of September, and this is absolutely prime time for catching lots and lots of big fish. You know, over the years, I've actually spent a lot of time, right now we're on the main artery in Sunset Country, or one of them, that's called Highway 105, and we're on the end of the road 
but over the years I've spent time on uh, Lac Sewell, uh, Peralt, Cedar Lake, you know, the Indian chain. In every one of these fisheries, if you want to go to really some fabulous, I mean, we're talking lots and lots of big fish. I mean, all different species of fish, everything from crappies, walleyes, muskies, big pike, whitefish, lake trout. This is a really, really unique area. This whole strip of water through here is just fantastic. But we're gonna talk a little bit about trophy fishing in Canada. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves. Adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. You know, so many people go up to a place like Gull Rock Lake up in Canada and they go out fishing and they want to start fishing immediately. One of my suggestions would be unquestionably is to go out and spend some amount of time with your electronics just looking for fish, looking for bait fish, looking at the habitat, how the fish are positioned on the habitat because that would really give you at least a good inkling on how to start whatever fish you're fishing for. Right now we're looking for big whopper walleyes. It's the second week of September, so we're hunting anywhere between 25 and 35 foot on these big main lake points that dump off into deep water. We actually have a wide variety of different presentations in the boat, you know, whether it be jigging, bottom bouncing, live bait rigging. We got a lot of stuff to fish, but how do you want to approach catching them? Yeah. Classically, to catch really big ones, uh, you can't beat a live bait rig in a big minnow. A uh, technique that uh, Troy and I got on this, uh, this particular point to what we've been doing is jig trolling. And this is just a half ounce uh, VMC Moon Eye jig with a 3.5 Big Bite Suicide shad on it. Oh, I didn't have the handle out. I should have that clam extend handle. It's a little better one. All right. The presentations are really sort of dynamically different because we're not casting the bait out and jigging it back. Nailed that. What we're doing is I'm getting on the trolling motor and I'm running at about 0.5 to 0.8 miles an hour and we just take the baits and throw them in back of the boat and you want to let out uh, just about enough line so the bait is close to the bottom or intermittently hitting the bottom. A lot of times what I like to do is to actually to hit the bottom then I reel it up a little bit so the bait is running like two or three feet off the bottom and that tail's going like this do, 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 do. and it's a fabulous technique in the fact that you can actually uh, cover quite a bit of water. That works. I've caught a lot of big fish uh, on these lakes at different points in times with this presentation. Back you go. This is another rig that we use a lot throughout the summer and into the fall. It's a really great technique and it, I've caught a lot of really big walleyes on it. It's simply the bottom bouncer and an original Rapala. This actually happens to be a 13, a bigger one. I'm targeting a pretty big fish. This la uh, lake to eat on a lot of Cisco's and Tulabies. Uh, I think uh, Troy's got a, uh, a number 11 broken back, but I got a three ounce bottom bouncer and what we're gonna do is just drop it down to the bottom, bottom and move really quickly. And, some of these spots are uh, so big. He's got, well, that, how long did that take? He, a minute? He, he got it down to the bottom. He's got one on. Yeah, yeah it was a good minute. The nice thing about this, this rig is in the fact that your ability to cover a lot of water really quickly. You know what I mean? That's the nice thing about the bouncer in the original Rapala. A lot of these spots are really big flats. You come up to a lot of these big Canadian lakes and the bars, like this particular bar here, is you know it's a half a mile long, you know. So, but what I just drove over it. We put a bunch of waypoints and coordinates, and there's fish spread out all along this edge of this big windblown point. So, what we're going to do is get down and start moving along it. About this is a little bit faster technique. We're going to be ro rolling at about eight, you know, point eight to about 1.2 miles an hour. Right there, come here. Oh. There we go. This segment is brought to you by BoatToTrailer.com, automatic boat loading and boat launching system. This is the first time I've been up to, uh, to this area with a forward facing sonar like uh, Hummingbird's Mega Live, but it's really sort of interesting. See, those are actually walleyes out in front of the boat. I'm looking 60 feet out. We're in uh, about 25 foot of water, but right on the edge of the ledge. But 
what it does is like when we're right now we're dragging live bait rigs and I can actually see where I want to pull the boat over where you can see I can scan around to my left and right nope there's another one that see that right there that's an, another nice one there I'm, you can look down on 2d sonar I'm just that fish is just slipping underneath the boat hit it on spot lock Go reeling down until you tighten up and go like that, and then you go like that, and then you get Mr. Whopper. <laughs> That's what it is. Oh, ooh. I know one thing, the icons have been getting a little workout today. <laughs> it's one thing that's fun, you come up into this area, it's just like, you pull up on every spot you go to. I mean, we've caught fish on just about every spot you go on. It's just like, it's amazing. Okay. Let's see what we got see here. What we got right about. All right, see the bait. Right oh, yeah. There, there you go. Come here, buddy. Scooper. scooper. That's what I mean. It's just yeah. a like, what? A real nice one. <laughs> Look at that. Not a giant, but a very, very nice fish, considering when you go out throughout the course of the day and you're gonna catch a bunch of these, you know what I mean? That's what's really fun about their coming up to this region. It's just amazing. The quality of the fishing is just stunning for just about every different species of fish you fish for. You know, when you're walleye fishing, uh, what I do is actually, when I look at spots, it's actually each spot is sort of laid out differently and actually how the fish are positioned on there will really determine the presentation. A lot of times when the fish are in really uh, very, very specific, very, very refined spots, it's a really great spot to live bait rig because you're moving along a, like a little 50 yard area of boulder ledge like we're on right now on the tip of a point. It's a very, very small spot. Oop, there's another one just coming up on 2D sonar right there. Those are the little rascals we're trying to catch right there. Yeah, yeah. we'll see how big this one is. Maybe it's bigger than that last one. Yeah, when you come up to sunset countries, you can see I'm looking around and I don't see another boat. So that's the other nice thing when you're when you're catching walleye and you don't see another boat. Boy, that is that adds to the experience and and makes it even more special. Okay, Mr. Mr. Troy, what are you thinking? All right, whopper stoppers. Well, I I don't know if it's a monster, but I'll tell you what, it's just. He's taking you a while to land. Yeah. There's the weight. Okay. There you go. That's a good one. There, there you yeah. go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There. They are. They're getting bigger and bigger. Walleye fishing, like all fishing today, tends to be very exact with the right length, power, and action of rod, combined with the appropriate size of reel and line for the given presentation tactic you happen to be fishing. When I'm classic live bait rigging, I'm using St. Croix slip and rig rod. It's seven foot six inches in length with a medium light power and an extra fast action. This is bar none, one of the nicest live bait rigging rods I've ever fished with. It's got the right length to pick up line for deep water hook sets and it's medium light power is really nice for fighting big fish with light line. That's the reel is Daiwa's 2500 Regal LT, which really balances this rod off nicely. For rigging, you need a reel with a good drag, and this Regal has it. You could see when I loaded up on it, you could tell it was like this one actually had some serious oomph to it. For the original Raplin bottom bouncer slow trolling tactic, I'm running St. Croix 7 foot medium heavy power with moderate action bounce and troll rod with a dial 100 size Lexa line counter reel. I use this combo for any trolling tactic that could be bottom bouncers, three way rigging, or flat line trolling applications. The line counter is key for a lot of trolling situations to duplicate a given depth pattern. It's got a super adjustable drag and a loud audible clicker that's nice for trolling. For jig trolling, I'm using the Legend Tournament. It's seven foot three inches in length with a medium power and extra fast action. Again, a 2500 Daiwa Regal LT spinning reel. It's interesting, all of these rod combos are spooled with the same line, and that's eight to 10 pound Suffix 832 braid with an eight pound fluorocarbon leader. Oh, that's another, another nice one. Not a monster, but I tell you what. <laughs> tell not, you a what. Mon not a monster. You get, you get spoiled up. 
up here, which it should it should be that way. You, you come up here, you want to get spoiled, and that is absolutely the case in Sunset Country. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these Daiwa drags. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. Got him. Got him? Yep. There you go. That's the right size. I got another one too. I got another I double header on. Really? Yeah, I got another one on. That's what I'm talking about. We got we got doubles. <laughs> we got doubled. Oh, it's a little one. There's different time frames when they come up to Canada. You know, so many people like coming up in spring when the fish are shallow, which is really tremendous time to fish. But the thing that I like about this fall bite is the fact that the fish are really uh packed together out in deeper water uh, situations. Let's see what we got here. There he is. No, it's a great big one, too. Yeah. <laughs> Another yeah. great big one. That one can eat the one that I, I just what? caught. Look at that. Look at that there. Look at that. Whoa. Great big gold beauty. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh. oh we saw it. Using great big minnows to catch them. The boys at camp here, Ian Cook, were staying at a Five Lakes here, and he says, you want to catch whoppers? put these big suckers on and drag them around in 25 to 35 off these points and you'll see what's actually in this lake. So I took his suggestion and it didn't take long. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ian Cook, um, owner and operator of uh, Five Lakes Lodge. Fully winterized facility. We work 365 days a year. Multi-species, uh, the five main lakes is uh, Gull Rock, Ranger, Two Island, uh, Keg, and then of course Red Lake is attached also. All accessible from our docks. Most of the lodges in the, in the system, all of the ones on Gull Rock, we are part of a Gull Rock Association, which uh, enables us to protect our large fish, catch and release um, on our big walleyes and northerns. So anything over 18 for our walleyes and, uh, and our northerns at 27 and a half, anything over those, um, we release back into the lake and uh, guys that want to take a trophy home, we replicate. And, it, and the fishery shows because of it. We have plenty of trophy northerns and walleyes to, uh, for folks to come up and, and, and be able to catch and release. The key with big minnows is figuring out how long to let them have it. <laughs> you I'm see not that. quite sure. I'm tightening up my drag. Yeah. Tightening up D here. I think if it's a real big one, I think they'll eat it pretty pretty quickly, I yeah. think. But With those smaller ones that aren't just kind of chewing on it. Yeah. As opposed to like Ooh. inhaling it. That's a good one. That's a big one. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. Oh yeah. Whoa. There we go. That sounds right. What? <laughs> a good sound. No, you could see so when I loaded up on it, you could tell it was like this one actually yeah. had some serious oomph to it. Yeah. Ooh. Come here, buddy. Wow. Oh, yeah. Look at that. There we go. Another good I mean, there. Wow. Nice. There we go. Well, I tell you one thing. What Ian was saying, put the big minnows down on the tips of these points and you'll really get the, the see what's going on pretty quickly. Oh, there we go. Just oodles and oodles of these guys. Not a giant, but when you consider you drop down it and it doesn't take long to get a bite. That, that's coming to this region. I mean, that's what it is. Boy, you come up here at the right time where you got the fall bite going on. You get these fish up and back down into the depths quick. The nice thing up here is just the amount of walleye. It's amazing, every spot we go to, we're marking a ton of fish. This lake, the system has an incredible carrying capacity, the number of walleye in here, and we can see a ton of bait. They have a, a, a great forage base, a great food source, and how healthy these fish are. You can see each one we catch, they're like filled out. I mean, they are really, really healthy, and that says a lot, no, not only about this lake, but also, many, many lakes 
throughout Ontario. The thing that's nice about the Mega Live, that because with this forward-facing sonar, I'm looking out 70 feet out in front of the boat, I can actually sort of direct where I see fish, I'm actually sort of scanning back and forth along this edge, and I can actually drive us right into the group of fish. Like when we see them right there, those are fish, and I'm gonna just keep on tracking right into those fish. There you go. Ooh. I don't know how big this is. Let's see. Feels good, feels a little better. It looks like a, that might be a netable model. Yeah, yeah. It could be, as you say, netable. <laughs> There you go, that's a good one. Come here, buddy. There you go. A nice there you one. go. There we go. Nice. Mr. Thank Troy. You. There Got you it. go, that's a good one. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, this is, there's a, this is, that's a nice one, but they they get so much bigger than this, but this, this size and up, that's fun. Absolutely fun. Let me get this thing back in the water, back to the depths. So that was on a number eight Shadrath. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. Do you want to be able to see in the water? The adventure begins. We are loaded for bear. We got You know, fights. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rides on a planet. No, no, I got him. Boy, these feel like big suckers. Oh, man. Wow. All right. Ready with the net. This has been a serious activity today. Yeah. What? Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh. Low light, prime time for catching whopperinos. Yeah. There oh, you yeah. go. That's a good one. That's there, come here, one. buddy. Yeah. There you go. What? <laughs> That's a real one. Yeah. What? Uh, attention. What? Oh, there you go. Nice. Look at that guy there. That's what we're talking. Boy, the beautiful fish, though. Whoa, come here, buddy. Look at that. Wow. That's why you come to sunset country on the 105 highways. There's so many of these lakes that have just tremendous fishing opportunities for, for big walleyes, muskies, big pike. Man, it's just unbelievable fisheries, no question about it. Look at that thing, beautiful animal. We'll get her back down into the depths. One of my favorite ministries that my wife and I have supported for years is In Touch Ministry and uh, uh, it's headed up by Charles Stanley. Uh, ever since I became turned on to the things of God at 37 years old and a light bulb went out big time, uh, I started following his stuff along with a number of other uh, uh, ministry work that really touches, it touches my heart. And this is just one of the daily devotion. I just wanna read this to you. It's uplifting, a good thing. He titled it Wonderfully Made. Have you ever considered that fingerprints are an amazing example of how much God cares for us? Each of us is born with a certain arrangement of arches, loops, and whirls on our hands, and they don't change as we grow or age. They are also exclusive. Think about that for a moment. Out of, out of the roughly 8 billion people on Earth, no two of us have the same fingerprint. We've each been uniquely created by God. What's more, he has a singular plan for every life. There's no such thing as a non-valuable person in God's eyes. He loves every single one of us equally and is personally involved in seeing his plans for our lives come to fulfillment. In fact, it brings him joy to do so. So instead of comparing yourself to others or feeling inconsequential, look at the intricacy of your fingerprints and remember, you are a one of a kind and well loved by the creator God who brought you into being. Then he has a little caption up that says, think about it. Have you recently spent time considering what God has planned for your life? Sit down with him in prayer 
and ask for guidance and clarification to get on a right track. And there, God is a loving, caring uh, God that has something for every one of us. If you're going through a hard time right now, my gosh, look in the mirror and know that God loves you. He created you for a special, unique person. You are a one of a kind with God-given talents that you have that nobody else has to speak to somebody of the things that he has done in your life to share with somebody else. Nobody else could do that but you. Just think about that in the next week or so. Hey, hey, from all of us here at the Edge, have a good safe fishing season. We'll see you on the water. You know, I fish uh, bass tournaments, regional bass tournaments around here. And the interesting thing is, is how these guys find spots in the summer going out in the spring. And what they do is take side imagery and they'll go and drop GPS coordinates on any hard bottom or rocks in these weed beds. And that's where the fish go to during the Got summer. Him. Got them. Got them. Yeah. Got them, Jim. Feels like a better one. Come on out of there, baby. Come on out of there. No, a little bit better. She grew up some. You know, it's the middle of summer and the bass are set up on all of their usual summer patterns. You know, in the lake that we're on, there's shallow water fish, they're on boat docks, there's frog and lily pads, bull rushes, and then there's the deep water bass, the fish on the deep weeds in heavy cover. And uh, that's what we're fishing right right now. And in many cases, when you get it right, they're the biggest bass in the system. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. Got him. A little better, Jim. Yep, that's a good one. A lot better. Yeah. It's a lot better. Yeah, there's some biggies in here. A lot better. <clears throat> this is so much fun. It's combat fishing. When you got a fish for big bass like this in the thick, dense, deep water cover, nothing, there's not a better presentation method period than a Tokyo rig. I mean, this Tokyo rig came on the scene some years ago, and it is one deadly way to fish. It goes through everything. It fishes in anything. It makes no difference. It's like in, when I first looked at this Tokyo rig when it came on the scene, I said, will a bass really bite on that thing? Boy, do they bite on it big time. And. Uh, they put together Tokyo rigs now. We have them available in all different sizes, hook designs, and everything to cover every aspect of soft plastic concoctions that you could put on the back of them. Jimmy's fishing a craw tube right now. I'm fishing a, a big bite bait, best flipping, flipping bait ever, which I really like. Yeah, yeah, you know, but there's a variety of different kind of soft baits that fit on the different size hooks and everything. It just gives you a, a basic idea of some of the baits you could use on this delivery system. You know, a lot of people think uh, weed fishing and they think Florida. You see all the big lily pad beds, but realistically, we live up in the north country in our northern natural lakes, and we actually have some of the probably the the best weed fishermen, and the reason being, we actually have a lot of really deep weeds. Right now, we're fishing in a weed bed that's it's 17 foot deep, and it's solid coontail, and I can actually see it. It's like three feet underneath the surface. And what, what we're attempting to do is to actually drive our baits directly down. You'll notice that Al and I are making very, very short casts, and that's for a couple of different reasons. Number one is your biggest goal is to take this Tokyo rig and actually just get it to penetrate to the bottom. The fish are on the bottom and there's like a canopy of these weeds and then there's room underneath where they, the fish can swim. And what we're trying to do is to actually punch this thing right through this dense weed canopy. 
in this particular lake, we have actually have weeds that grow down into, into 26 foot of water. It's actually changed a lot. This is actually my home lake in uh, central Minnesota. It's a gull lake. And the intriguing thing was, these weeds didn't used to be in this lake like this at all. The weeds were, the weeds, the old weed lines in this lake used to be like 12, 14 foot of water. Today with zebra mussels has changed the complexion of a lot of our lakes in the North Country. We have weeds growing deeper than they've ever been before. Got him. Not oh, bad, Jim. There's one. Oh, there's Not one. Not bad, oh. you too. Oh. I got a pretty there's decent a one, one too. There. You got a big one. Ah, now you're talking. Night, this is a nicer one. Huh? Pretty decent one. Take these all day long. You know, see, I look back at the history of the lake we're on. When I first got into business, I came back from Vietnam and I looked for a place to live with my brother Ron. And we picked the Brainerd Nisla area because of all the lakes. And I started guiding in this lake, Gull Lake is one of the lakes that I guided on for so many years. And Jimmy, growing up as a kid, when he started guiding, he fished here a lot. And let me clue you, what this lake looked like 50 years ago and what it is today, oh man. And the fishing is still, it's still one of the premier walleye lakes in the state. There's tons of bass tournaments on it every year because it's so good. Yeah, yeah, you know, zebra mussels got in there, it changed the environment, the water got clear, we got weeds like we never had before. Changed a lot over the years, but it's still fun, Jim. This segment is brought to you by Sunset Country, Ontario, Canada. You gotta come visit. Oh, there's one. Oh. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> come here, buddy. That's a good one there. Come on, there you go. Wait, but you can see how healthy these fish are. The cool thing is, is about the, with this Tokyo rig, you can you see how dense this weed cover is. They actually, they make a couple of different versions of uh, this rig. Uh, this actually, it actually is a five inch arm. They actually make a two and a half inch arm and you'll notice that it'll get bent up and that's really common when bass are biting on it, but you just take the pliers and just do a little t tweaking on it to straighten it back out. But the biggest thing is, is what this does is bounce on the bottom and it keeps that bait suspended up off the bo bottom so they can find it. And the other thing is big weight. And with this, I actually have almost uh, like three quarters of an ounce on here. And that weight is really critical. Number one, to get it down through the weeds. But the other thing is, is what it does is enable you when you hit the bottom, you're pounding the bottom. Actually, you have two different tungsten, VMC tungsten weights. And what these are doing, it's making a little bit of rattling sound. So what you're doing is attracting the fish to the bait. Got him? Yeah. You got a real, real one there? Yeah. Feels good, Jim. Yeah. yeah. You still there, baby? I think you are. Yeah, she's in there. Look at this. Nice one, too. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. She's... <laughs> come on, come on, come on now. They have you up. Oh. That's a better one. Yeah, it's a better one. All right. Man, Man it, it's, it is like combat fishing, <laughs> you know, to get these babies out of this stuff. You know, we got nice weather now. We do, it's not been fast. We're punking here. One here, we're punching these weeds with oh. one here. We know there's Shuck. a lot of fish on here, but we're scrounging enough out. When you got fish like that doing this, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Let's get her back. <sighs> hey, baby. There's one, oh, there's one, oh. That's what I mean, you gotta lean on them dogs. Oh, it, was, it's what, it wasn't even a biggie. <laughs> That's one thing, boy, you do, you had need the right equipment to land these guys out of this stuff here. It's so dense, you gotta play with them in the boat. Boy, but they're just beautiful. Fish have really been fattening up. Living these deep, 
I mean, this is just a monstrous weed bed. It's like amazing on how big this area is. This is like literally, there's hundreds of acres of weeds that grow to in, four, in 14 to 16 foot of water and they grow right to the surface. One of the real keys to finding fish in weed beds is setting up your map correctly. Right now, you'll notice that actually, I, I went to my chart and I actually set my depth highlight to 16 foot of water. 16 foot of water in this lake is the edge of the deepest weeds. In this particular case, you can see what we're fishing here. This is actually a great big weed saddle. So you have deeper water out here, deep water hole in here. And then you actually have some of these coordinates. These coordinates are where we've caught fish already, but when I zoom in, you'll notice a couple of different things. You'll notice that there's some like high spots. There's a 14 foot hump right there. There's an 11 foot high spot there. Then there's a big uh, point here that's a high spot. And what that forms is edges in the weed flat itself. And that's what's really critical. A lot of times these fish are on specific spots within these weed beds like this seven this 11 foot hump actually if you shook took all the weeds off there's actually rocks down in the intermittent spots on these uh in these weed flats can they can be really key spots to catch bass out of these weed beds like this this boat is rigged up about as nice easy to use and it flat out works it's a must have when you're talking about big waves well these trout are so darn tough this bait is legendary so that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins. There he is. Nope. Oh, come here. Come here, buddy. Oh, there we go. Come on. There we go. Sort of, sort of a no fooling type system here. You hit them, you can see what the, that's the weeds right there on the surface, and we're in 14 foot of water. So you gotta lean on them to get them out of there, especially when you get on them big ones. You get on the four and five pounders up in this lake here. It's really sort of interesting. Got to use really heavy duty line. Line is really, really critical for this type of fishing. I'm right now, I'm using 131. This is 30 or 40 pound uh, 131 braid. It's really thin. And what that enables you to do when you set the hook on the fish is that literally shears the weeds off. You know what I mean? That really thin braid is pretty critical for this type of fishing. Not only just, I mean, just to land them. I mean, you actually have to be fishing braid of some type. Got it. Come out of there, baby. Go oh, buried in there. Boy, is that a fatty. <laughs> man, oh man. I'll tell you, whether the bass are four or fives, or fish like this, just a little bit in there, they're tougher than nails. And to get them out of this stuff, you, you, you know, this is like, it's like combat fishing. Look, Jimmy's got one too. We gotta get back on it. Just punch, punch it in and lock us in here. Yeah, I'm gonna go over the guy. <laughs> wow. I'm bringing up the whole weed bed. Can you you got that fish in there? I don't know, I, I, I may. <laughs> it's pretty weird. Wow, wow, look at this. That's what we're fishing through. You can't, you can't even believe it. Oh, is there a fish in there? There is a fish in there. <laughs> Not even that big a one. <laughs> look at that. Boy, but they're healthy guys. But it goes to show you, that's what you're pulling the fish through. I mean, this is actually this stuff here. Right here, it's like 17 foot deep, you know what I mean? And so you, you really, what Al was saying about the rod is really pretty key. This is a legend tournament. Seven foot five, medium heavy, fast action rod. This is known as the workhorse. And that's what this, this, this type of fishing is. You know, most of the time we're not, don't have that much line out. Oh boy, you gotta get them out of this stuff, don't you? 
And when you get a bite, a lot of times we're only, you know, 12, 15 feet away from the fish. But you do have to reel them through the dense canopy, which is what the workhorse was designed for. But you just about four quick drops there, boom, boom, boom. One thing you'll notice, what we're doing is making short casts, letting the bait get, go directly to the bottom. But the thing is, we're just sort of shaking the bait there for a little bit. You know, I give it a couple of shakes. You don't get bit, pick up and make the next cast. And our, you know, the strike zone is relatively small in these dense weed beds and the fish, you know, only have like two, three feet of visibility. So you gotta get pretty close to them to get a bite. So what our objective is, is ultimately to punch as many holes through the weeds as you can. You know, what I'm using for as far as reel goes, this is a, a, a Daiwa Elite Pitch and Flip Reel. This is a 7.1 gear ratio reel. It's really designed for this. The one thing that's sort of nice, it's got a quick uh, release on the thumb bar. So what happens is a lot of times the fish will hit it when you, it's dropping. And what you don't have to do is, is engage the reel. I can just immediately engage the spool so I'm ready to set the hook instantaneously. And once you get used to fishing that way, what I'm doing a lot, I'm flipping the bait out. As it's dropping, I'm giving it slack line. You either engage the spool or turn it over immediately. And I'm following the bait down Get it down on the bottom to wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Oh, there's another one. Yep, no, no, come here. Oh, I don't know if that, what is that a pike? No, it's a bass. Oh, boy, that's a, uh, a little pot of them in here. <laughs> the nice thing about this uh, rig that's sort of cool about the, uh, Tokyo rig, it's really a positive hooking bait. The reason being is because the, uh, you can see I'm um, just on a, a ring, a welded ring, and then you actually have a barrel swivel, but the hook is separated from the weight. And so when the fish grab it, they're just biting. In this particular case, they actually have an EWG or extreme wide gap, but they make it in a variety of different hooks, whether it be a big worm hook or a uh, even a big uh, straight flipping hook, heavy duty flipping hook, but it's really a positive hooking bait for this type of situation. We are loaded for bear. We got you know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rides on a planet. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these die with drag. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. You know, you hear a lot about uh, people using forward facing sonar and what, uh, you know, a lot of times we're using it for actually sight fishing and they actually see the fish. But what I'm actually using it here in this particular condition is to find the densest weeds. And you can see when I shift it to the right, I got that really thick weed wall. And this happens to be coontail, but you know, see how I pan to the left here a little bit and how it gets really sparse. So what I'm doing is following that edge right there. As I'm moving along, I'm following that very, very thick wall right here. And you can see how it thins out. And, you know, while they're fit, you can see there's some bluegills out here, but a lot of times the fish are sitting in that, that's where the bass are positioned in a lot of these really dense weed beds. You're looking for this like distinct edge of really thick weeds. Got him. Got him? Yeah. Ooh, feels like a good one. There yep. you go. <sighs> yeah, a little bit better. We're getting kicked up a little bit better there, James. <clears throat> huh. It's a nicer fish. Definitely a nicer fish. You know, we've had had some pretty horrendous weather up north. Here, winds like crazy. But yet, you know, when you're fishing like this, doing what we're doing, which is fishing for bigger fish, and you can find schools of them doing this, there is not a better delivery system for soft plastic in heavy cover than the Tokyo rig. I'm, I mean, I know a lot of anglers on tour that almost fish this exclusively 
in most conditions. Naturally, they adapt to the conditions they're in. But this bait, for heavy, dense, thick, matted cover, there's not another delivery system, period, that can be fished like this. It's that good. You know, many years ago, shortly after the Word of God became real to me, and I started to get into it on a regular basis, turned my life over to the Lord, and really dug into the Word, I was at a retreat. And uh, for lack of a better word, a retreat. It was in Canada. And it had uh, a bunch of men that, that came for the weekend, and it was all fishermen. And you had different speakers that talked about uh, uh, their faith in God, how they came to know the Lord, and uh, 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 the impact that it has had in their life. And you had people from all different walks of life. And one of the speakers there, who was a pastor from a small church in Canada, as he was challenged us with something that I'll never forget. He said to me, of not me, to all of the men there, is anybody going to heaven because of you? I'm gonna say that again. Is anybody going to heaven because of you? He said those words and it got out of my head and into my heart immediately. I said, oh, wow, wow. <laughs> uh, it is one of those things that I'll never forget. And it had a massive impact on my life. That's the reason that I do this show the way I do it. And, and, and I want to be able to glorify God on the things that he's blessed me with in my life, be a blessing to uh, uh, people that believe in the word, people that are searching, that are looking to know more, uh, uh, grow in their spiritual life, uh, body, mind, and spirit become one. They're more active in all of them. And uh, occasionally I get an opportunity to share the gospel, the truth that Jesus died for your sins, rose again, sitting at the right hand of the Father, a confession of faith in him as Lord and Savior, opens up the gates of heaven. It's got nothing to do with denominations, anything like that. That is the foundation of the Bible, and Jesus is the foundation of all of that. It's really that simple. But that seed got planted in my heart, and I still think about it all. I wrote it down, it is in right at the beginning of my Bible, right there, and it's been sitting there since that retreat. Is anybody going to heaven because of me? Anybody going to heaven because of you? Think about it this week. Hey, from all of us here at the Edge, you have a good, safe fishing season. See you on the water. There's a nicer kill, I think, Al. Feeling right, we'll see. Not a giant one, but pretty nice fish, huh? We'll take that here, starting to get a little, little bit bigger. Sun's warming up, you know, this is uh, just, it's, it's springtime. It's the first of June today. So it's kind of that early summer, late, sp whoa, late spring type of a deal. And it's just a great time to be out on the water, multi-species fishing. And really right now, Al and I are targeting sunfish. We're looking for some big bluegills. Any chance you've got to get on a pre-spawn bite, whether it's bluegills, crappies, muskies, you name it, the fish are very, very aggressive. So. We're fishing with aggressive presentations, little micro jerk baits, the X-Trap 4, and we're just gonna catch a pile of fish today. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. I got a nice crappie here. Not huge, but... Nicer. You got your next year class up? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Better? Yeah. That's what we're... Well, those are not bad. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Take those all day. Oh yeah. Jeez. Yeah, that's a nice fish. Nicer than I thought. This bait has just been amazing. I mean, ever since I found this thing for smallmouth bass, I remember watching Al do a show on smallmouth bass years ago with the X-Trap, and it was like the most amazing lure ever. And since that point in time, it has become my absolute favorite bait ever for catching everything. Big crappies, right now we're targeting bluegills. You'll notice I've got a little waxworm on there. 
trying to coax a few of the bigger bluegills into, into biting it right now. But man, what an amazing bait to throw around in the spring. What do you got there? It's Still a nice, a nice shift, Yeah, nice shift fish. But those hooks on this x wrap even though I got, I got the barbs, the barbs are flattened out on this thing. So you can, cause you know, when you get the bluegills, they're grabbing it and they got the, the tail hook in their mouth and it's so much easier. Yeah, you know, you, we snip the barbs off so you can handle the fish so much quicker. And the needles are, the needles, it's like needle sharp. Is that a better one? Mm, looks like I a don't, better one. I don't know that it is. They're just the bluegills feel so nice. I was just talking about how much I love the X-Wrap. Man, oh man, if we had, wow, look at that one, that's a beauty. Amazing success with hard baits for panfish recently. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when I was growing up, you wouldn't even really think about doing anything for panfish unless it involved a hook and a leech or a night crawler or a wax worm, maybe a jig. Plastics were the extreme, but I'm telling you what, we've just had such incredible success with hard baits in recent years for big bluegills, big crappies, they're always in the boat. And we're in a situation right now where we set out to catch fish on little micro X wraps and we are catching them every single cast, but seeing a lot of bigger fish in here. And that's why we're fishing the minnow baits, hoping to select for the bigger fish. I put this little top water on, this little popper right here, and it's just been bam, 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 every cast. So. So I'll get this guy back and hopefully catch one that's quite a bit bigger. And I can tell you one thing, if I catch a couple more on top water, pretty sure Al's gonna put that <laughs> X-Wrap down and say, I want in on top. Nice, nice crappie, Al. Nice crappie. Nice crappie. Not a bad crappie. Feels like that one you had before. Nice healthy ones. At this time of year, it's so much fun. You know, you come back here, somebody asks you, well, how'd you guys do today? Oh, we caught a couple hundred. Yeah, you know, we're out about four hours. <laughs> it's bluegills, it's crappies, it's bass, it's perch. You can't bait a hook if you're using bait. You can't catch more fish faster than what we're doing with artificials, whether the crappies or the bluegills. It's impossible. And it's just a matter of cycling through and you get the bigger, bigger, bigger fish. A little bit more like you're popping on them gills, you get a a bigger one doing that. But once you start doing this, you're like the kid in the candy factory. It takes you back to the days when you were sitting on the dock and you were about five years old and you were watching those bluegills all over the place and you started to catch a couple of them and you got lit up. Like, uh, uh, it turned you on to the sport of fishing. You know what I'm talking about. You're one of those people sitting on the dock looking at the bluegills. It turns you on to fishing. It's so great. And this is the same thing. You know why? Because you're getting bit constantly. And it's so much easier when you don't have to bait up all the time, when that bite is on, and it's on more times on an artificial than most people realize for the gills or the crappies, actually. This segment is brought to you by Sunset Country, Ontario, Canada. You gotta come visit. You know, we're sitting in about three feet of water in the back end of the shallow chute, and then we're throwing up, in some cases, to about a foot and a half. You could fish this bait in extremely shallow water. Yeah, yeah, you know, with very short pops. A lot of times, I'll, when I'm getting shallow like this, I'll hold my rod up like this, and I'm twitching the rod just like this. That bait is just, you know, just twitching in place. You know, it's really shallow. It's probably a little, not much more than a foot under the surface. Yeah, you know, and I'm hardly moving it, and they're coming in, and they're looking, you know, they look at that tail, and they go, boom. And on sunny days, those bluegills and crappies, sometimes they'll get, they'll get in water this skinny, and you can still fish a bait like that. The other advantage with this X-Wrap, too, is opposed to the traditional spring fishing technique of, a, you know, a jig and a, and a bobber, it's almost like presenting a little fly in the water so you can have really silent entry when it hits it's not scaring the fish away and it also just gets i mean it, it you get those reaction bites out of the fish too a lot of times it's like it hits the water and bam they're on it so it's a really really deadly technique the more i fish it the more i'm absolutely sold that this is like the number one springtime panfish bait of all time crop yeah pretty decent one too oh, yeah. i'm always amazed at the attitude these crappies have you'll see it when i lift this guy in the boat 
Look at that, head first. How many times are people out here thinking about crappies, thinking that they're just gonna come up, kinda nose the bait, maybe just grab the tail of the minnow? Crappies can be super aggressive. I mean, it's amazing the baits that these things will hit. And they are absolutely not afraid to smash baits like this. And this is the size four, but believe it or not, if I'm fishing decent crappies, I'm fishing the size bigger than this, the size six a lot, because crappies will hit relatively large baits. How many times have you been out walleye fishing and caught one of the biggest crappies of the year, bass fishing, throwing a Ned rig or something like that and caught a huge crappie? So don't be afraid to throw bigger baits for crappies. They definitely love hitting stuff like this. You know, one of the biggest mistakes I think bluegill and crappie fishermen consistently make is not fishing small enough and light enough. On this particular rod, I've got suffix monofilament on here. The reason that I wanted that, that for this kind of fish, I knew we'd be fishing real shallow. And I wanted to make sure my bait stayed a little bit higher and the mono helped me do that. That was my thinking behind it. Jer, I, I know is fishing nano braid with, uh, uh, I'm a, a pretty sure a fluorocarbon leader. We're using four pound test line and it just, it, it's the key to catching more fish. I'm using the new uh, Avid series rods from St. Croix. This particular rod that I'm throwing right here is a six foot nine inch medium light power extra fast action. And recently St. Croix has done a phenomenal job of bringing panfish rods to the industry that are made strictly for panfish. Pan fishing has come a long way and a rod reels and lines have been a part of it where you can go out and catch fish after fish after fish like this. The equipment, like it is for any kind of fish, is one of the keys to making it a lot of fun and very successful. Ooh, greeny. Nice, pretty one. Yep. If you've seen pumpkin seed sunfish, you know how pretty they can be. These things can be even prettier than pumpkin seeds another week or so and they'll start getting ready to spawn and this will be one of the prettiest fish you'll ever see swimming in fresh water. They can be nice and aggressive too. I like catching those. Ooh, that's a nice crappie, isn't it? Yeah, no, not really. Not really? Just a real aggressive one. No, it's it's not a bad one, but it's not a... Not a magnet. It's not like them other ones. So, it's still so much fun to catch fish after fish after fish. You know, when we came in today, the lake we're on is not, you know, a real big lake. And uh, the total, I look at the cars at the access, and there, there's about eight boats at the access here today. Two of them were bass boats, and the rest are pan fishermen. And it's that time of year. You've got two guys fishing bass. I'm assuming they're in a bass boat. Maybe they're fishing gills and crappies. I don't know. Jerry, that's a big that's one. That's a nice one, yeah. Uh, not a huge one, but well, nice. Well, give me a second here, here <laughs> while he gets that fish in. I don't know what Al was going to say, but one thing that I will say is one of the comments we ran into some folks out here, and they said, ah, we haven't run into anything. We're not catching anything. And you know what? They're probably just going to a spot where they fished before, they're soaking bobbers, and really, you gotta spend some time hunting these fish. Al and I started, we put the trolling motor down. We really weren't using our electronics all that much, more so the map to find the shallow little bay here. And then from there, we just got the trolling motor down. We started looking, looking with our eyes. Pretty soon, oh, there's a pike. Oh, there's a bass. And then you see a school of bluegills. And that's when you really start to slow down. You fish a lot slower. And if, you, if we were out here just pulling up to this point where we caught them in the past, soaking a minnow, we wouldn't have caught anything. You gotta be aggressive in finding the fish. And then when you get them, you don't need to sit around and monkey around with bait. Those guys didn't catch a single fish and we're catching them every cast. And we don't have minnows in the boat just artificial ones. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> I was going to talk about those guys. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these Daiwa drags. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have. You're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. A little better? Pretty decent, I it think. It looks yeah. like a little, little better a one. one. Yeah. That's better. Oh yeah, that's what we're looking for. There are some really big ones in this lake, but the way bluegill fisheries have been going in recent years, that's still a pretty nice bluegill just about any anywhere you go. 
It's pretty cool what we're doing here in the state of Minnesota with some of our panfish, panfish lakes, special regulation lakes. We've got a lot of lakes now that are, uh, this guy go, a lot of lakes now that are a five fish limit, a 10 fish limit. And so we're selecting a number of lakes that have had a history of producing big sunfish in particular, but also crappies because you think about a sunfish, you might think, oh boy, those things just grow real quick. There's, there's nothing to sunfish, but big bluegills can be very old and they are very, very rare. So it's hard to find those really special bluegill lakes, but it's encouraging to know that the future is looking bright in Minnesota with the uh, quality bluegill initiative that we've got going on here. So that's a pretty, pretty cool thing. You know, when you get these fish in this real shallow water like this, this time of the year, in my observation, these protected little corners where the sun is cooking, cooking in, draws a lot of fish. But one thing, you know, that, that's awesome about this time of year too that I'll say is, you know, this with the boat that we're in right now, I mean, it's absolutely loaded with the most amazing technology. We've got side imaging, down imaging, 2D sonar, 360, we've got live imaging. And this is one of those times of year where you don't even need a boat to take advantage of a hot bite like this. Springtime is when the fish are shallow. If Al and I were stuck fishing on the shore over by that rock here, we would be having the same results as we are sitting in a boat with $20,000 worth of fancy equipment. So it's, it's just a great time of year for anybody, regardless of the equipment you have, to get out and take advantage of some of the funnest fishing of the year. It's just fabulous. You catch everything doing this. Everything all over the place. That little guy. But in terms of, uh, you know, talking about all the different technology we have but aren't currently using today, one of the most critical pieces of technology you really, really, really have to have, and it's important every time you're fishing, but is, is good eyewear for this type of thing. Polarized glasses make all the difference in the world. It's just amazing. I take people fishing off the, you know, at the dock, at the cabin, you're like, oh, there's a fish, there's a fish, there's a fish, and they don't have polarized glasses, and they don't even know what you're, what you're talking about. And so these fish, just in this little back corner here, the pot is over here, the pot is here, the pot is over here. Al and I can just stay on them. It's not because we're using magic sonar technology to see them. We're just using our eyes and good polarized glasses. Just one of those that likes to dive around a lot. We wear the Wavy Label brand sunglasses. They're from our hometown in Brainerd. They've got a lifetime warranty. They just make an awesome product. You can get them in glass, you can get them in plastic, but really an awesome deal. And I like the amber lens. I just think it's the most versatile lens for doing stuff. And if you don't have these, you're not gonna be in the game. You got a nibble, Al? A gill. A little bit better one. A little bit better one. Oh yeah, that's a nice yeah, one. Yeah, this one's starting to get up there. Yeah, and that's a nice one. Not a King Kong, but it definitely is a nice one. Anytime I can catch gills like that on artificials, I'm excited. It ain't a real big one, but I'll take them all day. <laughs> nice. It's funny how you get crappies and bluegills of the same size, and the bluegills always just fight so much harder. Al talked about the rods that we're using. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the reel that I've got that I've got on here. And, and the biggest thing is not necessarily the reel itself, though there's some great features of this reel. It's, it's the size. So a lot of pan fishermen are fishing 500, 750 size reels. And that can, that's fine for ice fishing, but I really am fond of fishing the 1,000 size reels. And even in some cases, the 2,000 size, the frame of a 1,000 and a 2,000 are the same. It's just that the arbor size is a little bit bigger. And now when we're fishing X-wraps like this, this is a slack line presentation. So you want to be able to pick up line very quickly. So the bigger spool helps you pick up line more quickly. It also is better for line management so you can get further casting distance than you would with a smaller arbor, smaller size reel. The one I've got on here, this is Daiwa's Fuego. Absolutely a dynamite reel. This is in that $100 price point, about as sweet as you can get. And one of the features that this reel has that makes it last for such a long time is something called mag seal. The mag seal prevents any intrusion from water, from dust, and it makes the reel smooth for a long, long time without creating the friction that you get from a traditional seal. So for a $100 reel to have a feature like that in there is, is unbelievable. Now every time we talk about Daiwa reels, it's the same thing. Listen to the drag. 
the big thing with, with fishing panfish stuff is get a reel with a good drag. You're fishing light line. You always run into a big pike, a big bass. You might get the bluegill of a lifetime. So don't chintz on something where you're going to hear the drag on zit, 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 dial reels. It's always as smooth as it gets. So that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. Do you want to be able to see in the water? The adventure begins. We are loaded for bear. We got You know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rods on a planet. Now, one thing I've seen with bluegills over the years of fishing them is they are a fish that there are times when bait can make a huge, huge difference. Bluegills, sometimes like this, we'll go through, we'll throw this little X wrap around, we'll catch a bunch of fish, and you see that there are fish there that are tentative. But I found that just getting a little tub of wax worms, and I'll just take right where that feather is, and I'll just thread a wax worm around the hook those three times. That kind of makes it my little trailer. And a lot of times you can start catching fish after fish after fish after fish again. There we go, that's more like it. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Wow, wow, wow. Lift him in, oh yeah, this is what we're talking about. Absolutely a magnum, magnum, magnum sunfish. And I just wanna show you, I was talking about that little tip. I had been casting in this area. I'd made six or eight casts and not gotten bit. Put that waxworm on there, came in and just grabbed that. That's absolutely a beautiful sunfish, truly a trophy in where you swim, and you absolutely have to let fish like this go. These are just such a rare resource anymore. So special to catch. That was the goal for the day right there, get one like that. I got to tell you, when Jer put me on this bike with that, for, for, for bluegills and, and crappies some years ago, I got hooked on it. Then when you stop and think, everybody that we've had out here, here you, they experience this what we're doing for panfish, and they light it up. Jer's, Jer, Jer's an avid, hardcore musky fisherman. That's where he's gonna be in a couple of days. Yet he's out here like a kid in a candy factory. And I am, I'm an avid smallmouth fisherman. That's, I'm, I'm, that's my fish of choice, smallmouth and walleye. Yet coming out here on days like this, catching a bunch of bluegills and crappies, it makes you young again, baby. It makes you young again. Another one he's got. Have you ever said something that as soon as you finish saying it, you thought, oh my gosh, I wish I never said this, but you don't get a do-over. It's said, it's done. We all been there. We all know what I'm talking about. You wish you could take some of these things back. Some of them have a major impact on people's lives, not only yours. And I'll give you an example of something that really, so it sounded simple, but it left a mark on me. And it happened just a short while ago, spring of the year. I'm crappie fishing on a lake not too far from, my, uh, from our office. There's two boats of us out there and, and we're catching a reasonable amount of fish. We're coming to, to get back off, to go to another spot, pull the boat out of the water. And there's two guys anchored in, in, in a, a, a boat fishing a particular area. And I'm following the boat in front of me to get off the water. And where these guys were fishing, I know this sounds dumb. It was tight, tight between shore, and we came kind of closer than we should have between them and the spot that they were fishing. And as, as we came through, these guys in the boat had some choice words for us. And one of them, the last thing he says is, I passed through, he says, Al, you should know better. I went through, I can't forget those words. Al, you should know better. I should have stopped and went back and apologized, I didn't. Hey, I hope you're watching that television show right now. I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. Your words meant a lot to me. It, res it went in, it burned into my heart. As somebody that professes to be a Bible-believing Christian, I should know better. My action should make a difference, and I can't tell you how often that was a check in my mind and in my spirit, I should know better. And I just have to share that with you. Because again, if you're watching, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What you said, those words, I should know better, has changed my life for the better. 
Hey, from all of us here at the edge, you have a good, safe fishing season. We'll see you on the water. There, got him, got him. Got him, ooh, big yep. one, big one. Oh, that did not. What's in? Oh, oh he's off. What? Troy, that was huh. a big, that was a big animal. Yeah. Like musky sized fish. Yeah. Wow. Bucktail. Huh. Right there, big one right there. Look at him right there. Right there. Oops. Oh, okay. there's, there's one. Uh, there's <laughs> As one. You're looking at one. What? I, I'm looking at one, and there's another one there. That's a good one. Come here. That's a nice, nice size pike. Look at him. Whoa. There we go. Come here, buddy. Come on. Come on, you little rut, you. Oh, yeah. Whoa, whoa. Come here. Oh, wow. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Just, scoop them just like and that. Just leave them, nice. in the, leave them in the net, and I'll get, yeah. I'll get the correct tools right here. You never go to Canada without the right tools. I like fishing these single hook baits. Oop, like that. Get them right out of there. Boy, look at the healthy fish. That's one thing, you know, we're on so many of these lakes at Gull Rock and Red Lake, a lot of these Canadian lakes have tremendous populations of not only northern pike, but one of the biggest things is the forage. And that's tulipies and whitefish. Look at that nice fish. Beautiful animal. Look at that. Boy, wide body. Pretty, pretty animal. We'll get her back in the water. Come on. Wow, come on. Come on. Boy, are they cool, really cool looking fish. Wow. There you go. Nice. How do you like that? My new favorite lake. Yeah. <laughs> I'm easy. Two bites right away. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves. Adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. You know, it's interesting, we're up here in the uh, second week of September, and so many people like coming up to Canada in spring. I, I know one thing, I've actually been up here, you know, throughout the summer, fall, and spring, and actually uh, summer and fall is one of my favorite times of the year to come up here. The reason why is a lot of times we have a lot more fish concentrated in smaller areas, you know, whether a, a lot of times like the walleyes that are like in this lake are probably going to be piled up around the deep water basins. You've got a, these big flushes of pike coming into the, into the bays, and you can still, we could probably catch some of these big pike out in deeper water as well. But it's a good time of the year to come to Sunset Country. There, got him, got him, got him. Another one? Big one. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Oh. Whoa. This is probably about five casts after James landed his. This is a big one. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, this would be one of my biggest pike in many, many years. I can tell you that much. Oh, yeah. Nice one. Oh, yeah. Come here, buddy. Come here. Wow. That was easy. There you go. I'll move him, I'll move him back over by yeah. you, by you wow. here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that fish. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> wow. That's a, wow. Wow. That's the biggest pike I've caught in, in many, many years. This was five casts after James caught his. Time to get this thing back and keep hunting for more. Wow. What a way to start the trip. Absolutely oh, yeah. incredible. Aren't they pretty? Gosh, yeah. they're wild. Wow, wow. Are, look, look at the girth on those things. Jeez. What? I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah, These are, that's pretty awesome. Wow, wow. A lot of people think that northern pike are always up in shallow water weed beds, but realistically, uh, they're pretty temperature sensitive. In many lakes, when the water gets too warm, what they do is they, once it gets above like 65, 67 degrees throughout the summer, they dump out into deeper water basins. But in fall again, like we're up here in the second week of September, that water temperature right now is at like it's almost perfect. It's 64 degrees. A lot of those fish, the big fish that we're feeding on deep water forage, ciscos and tulipies in the deep water, come back into the shallow water, uh, big cabbage beds. You know, they, they move a lot, you know, and one thing you get in the right systems where they actually have tremendous populations of those great big ones. This segment is brought to you by Big Bite Baits, designed to bring the big bite to your line.
You know, one thing that's really a key right now is finding weeds. And well, well, how do you go find that in a Canadian lake? When you look at these lakes, I mean, they're rock everywhere, but there is a little bit of an art to go finding them. And, and part of it is using my Lake Master map. And what I can do with this, uh, the deep weeds in this lake grow to about eight foot of water. So what I did is put my uh, shallow water highlight at about 10 foot. And then what I do is look at the contours in the backs of these bays, these really big, slow, tapered uh, bays. And you can see we have a creek coming in here, but you can see we have a really big, tapered flat in here. And a lot of times, what that is, you get into back ends of these bays, that's where you'll find sand, not only sand, you have this fertility coming in, and you'll find these big weed beds. And that's what we've been doing, just hopscotching around. When you look at the map, we've been just running down the lake, going to every back end of the bay, but you'll notice the one thing where we've also been targeting, it's directly associated to the main basin of the lake, the deeper water. A lot of times, you know, intermittently these fish are going out and feeding on these deep water tulipies and ciscos, then they move back into the bay. Oh, there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I just... <laughs> that one? Yeah, it was right near the boat. That one just kind of came up. I'm throwing that inline spinner. And running kind of under the surface, so that one came off. That might be... Wow. Ooh, ooh. Another... <laughs> they are... What? Oh, they are fun. This would be an easy hook out when they're right at the top of the mouth there. Yeah, he's perfect. You, oh, yeah. you want to just unhook them right up outside? You could, yeah, just unhook, well, you could just unhook them. Yeah, I might be able to. Yeah, he's kind of... Sometimes they... Uh, you got them snouted so nicely. Sometimes when they're, yeah, this one isn't real big. There's some just some giants in here. Come here. Oh, yeah. Easy one. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when they, oh, look at that. This is nice. It's one little pop like that, and the fish is out. Nice one. Yeah. You know, pike are really unlike walleyes or bass where you're going to find a, a rock pile or a weed bed and there's a whole bunch of them in a really small spot. The weird thing is, is the way these fish lay out, you get a big weed bed and the fish will be spread out. So it gives you a little bit of inkling of how you have to fish them. That's why we're moving along pretty rapidly. We're coming through there and we're looking for the hot biters and moving on and just hopscotching bay to bay to bay to bay. I'm just pulling up along this island here when I see all these cattails, thinking that there might be uh, some other uh, weed bed out in front of it. You can see all these bulrushes out in front of the weeds here, in front of the island here. Oop, there he was. <laughs> I cast it right to him. I said, there's one. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one there. Come yeah. here, buddy. Oh, yeah. Look at the size of that little whippersnapper. <laughs> That's a real one. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Come here, buddy. Come here. Boy, that's a good one. That's a good oh, yeah. one there. That's, that's, another, a, that's, a, that's a pretty, sp that's, a, that's a sporty one. You want me to talon? No, nope. Nope, we're all right. Play him out. Okay. Come here, buddy. Ooh, yeah. Oh, Look yeah. at that one there. Ooh. Come here. Come here. Where'd he go? There. There we go. Wow. This little scoop. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. another size up. You know, that's what I was saying. We're really running gun fishing. We're, you know, covering a lot of water really quickly with pretty uh, fast moving baits because, you know, you're really looking for the, uh, these are really aggressive predators. Boy, that's a beautiful fish. Come here, buddy. Look at that thing. That's a beautiful pike. Look at that thing. Look at that. Gorgeous animal. Wow. Let's measure this one here. We've got a, a ruler on here. She's probably a, about a 40, 41, 41 and a quarter. But look at the girth on that thing. Beautiful, beautiful fish. We'll get her back in the water. That's a real wide body there. Come here. Come here. Wow. Whoa. Nice job, man. Now that's serious pike fishing. <laughs> yeah, you hit them yeah. at the right time. Yeah. And I'm not kidding you. That's what a lot of people come up here to Canada. You know, while walleye fishing is a big thing. You know, we have fabulous smallmouth bass up in Sunset Country, but northern pike, if you like to fish, they're one fun, tough customer.
They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these Daiwa drags. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. You know, when you're thinking about pike fishing, there's three different ways to kind of break it down when you're talking about the action of the baits. Side to side, kind of a, a jigging up and down, and then a straight line. Now I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth. James is throwing this boxer head jig, a one ounce boxer head. This is a seven inch big bite bait suicide chat. He's jigging it and snap jigging it across the bottom, almost like he's bass fishing or walleye fishing, snapping it up off the bottom. I actually had one follow my glide bait. So this is a nice erratic side-to-side -side action on this, as well when we're talking about erratic side-to-side, -side, well, you gotta mention the bigger X-Wrap without question. And also, I've got a few, I've been doing really good in this, actually a number of fish on this size six inline spinner from Blue Fox. This thing is, is dynamite, and this is a straight line retrieve. So these three actions, depending on the mood of the fish, are very, very important. Experiment with all three. You're gonna find one that predominantly works excellent throughout the day. Something like this, straight line, just cast it out and burn it in, and the fish just crush it. Oh, yep, got it. Right at the tip of the, the tip of that weed bed out there. Size. A nice one, yeah. I mean, they're all nice. I don't know, what might be a little bigger. You got an alligator? Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like that. Yeah, this is a gator. Jack, jackfish. Yeah. Yeah, this is a little gator here. Great Northern Pike. Yeah. Might need a second here. Well, I kind of swing to this side of the boat. Wow, the wow. average yeah. size this, structure of the fish we've yeah, been seeing. Yeah, that's the thing. Wow, that's a sporty mile. That's, that's a sporty mile. Right, right wow. See if, Sorry about that. Oh, wow. That's a nice wow. easy scoop. Wow. Oh, yeah, there, <laughs> yeah, it looks <laughs> nice. Wow. Right, now I woke up. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, oh my gosh. Look. Another just beautiful. These, these fish are so clean and so incredible. I mean, this is, this is real pike fishing. This is just so awesome. Wow. Get over that. The nice thing about this boxer head and the suicide shad combo is the fact I can fix, fish it a variety of different ways. I can feel it, or reel it really, really fast, almost like a inline spinner bait. By the same token, I, if the fish are more inactive, I can actually jig the bait off the bottom. And I've been catching fish both ways. When the fish were really active, like in the morning, I was just reeling it, almost like an inline spinner bait, really just really, really fast. But this afternoon, after they sort of slowed down, I've been doing a lot more bouncing the bait intermittently on the bottom, jigging it up off the bottom. When these fish get inactive, a lot of times what they do is they'll just drop down to the bottom and sit in the weeds. Got him. Yeah? Got him. That's, whoop, whoop, watch yourself. Whoop, gotcha, whoop. gotcha, gotcha. Whoa. <laughs> Switch. Well, yeah, that's yeah, a little shaking bait. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. You can wow. call him up sometimes with that swim bait and then, wow. Oh, nice. That's a big one there. Yeah, I'll get the net when you, oh. yeah, you just get that. If you lift up your oh, leg. Sorry about that. Oh, There's no, a, no. Look at that fatty. Wow. Oh, yeah. Look at that thing. Lead them right into that. There scoop. we go. Wow. Nice easy scoop for you. Wow. That was that was cool. Yeah. Beautiful fish though. I mean look at that thing. Lots of them. You know one thing that uh, you're talking about pike fishing, all these weed beds are not created equal. And what I mean by that, uh, Troy and I are actually fishing more um, like main lake weed beds. And if you can find these big weed beds that access that deep water, they seem to be better at this time of the year. You know, early season fishing, you can fish way in the back ends of those creeks, way back in the big shallow flat bays. Not at this time of the year. You wanna find this main lake stuff. 
Well, that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins. We are loaded for bear. We got You know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rides on a planet. You know, it's been a good day of pike fishing when I have four band-aids on my hand from a little bit of northern pike teeth. You know, as, as far as rods and reels go, uh, I actually have four different rods and reels in the boat that Troy and I have been using, but the interesting thing is they're almost all the same power and action and length. What we're doing is, you know, throwing a lot of high-speed baits. We're hooking big fish and fighting big fish. This happens to be a St. Croix Legend X medium heavy, moderate, fast tapered rod. Medium heavy is really nice in the fact that I can cast these big baits, but the up front, it's relatively soft tip that bl blends farther back down the taper of the blank. Northern Pike, they make really big, strong surges and ripping around the boat. And that moderate, fast taper enables you to uh, maintain tight on, on the fish. It's a, just, they're just great rods for fighting fish, not only presenting the lures, but fighting the fish. As far as a reel goes, this is a Daiwa Tatula 307.1 gear ratio reel. It's got the 90 millimeter uh, paddle handle. It's got a really fast pickup because we're actually doing a lot of burning and putting a lot of erratic behavior into the bait. So we're putting a lot of slack line and you want that pickup, a lot of times they'll pick up the bait and they'll running towards you. So you're reeling up really fast to hook them. But it's a, it's a nice reel in the wow. fact that it's also actually is a little bit bigger spool. Right now I actually have this spooled with 30 pound test uh, suffix uh, performance braid. And uh, it's just a great combination for this style of fishing. This is absolutely my favorite rod and reel combo for big, big snake fishing. What's nice about pike fishing up here, we're getting numbers of big fish. You know, when you're talking about 15 to 25 pound fish, not just one fish. You know, if you're musky fishing in Ontario, you can fish a few days, but you're going after that 30 to 40 pound fish. And if you're walleye fishing, you know, you're coming up here maybe a, a eight, nine, maybe 10 pound walleye. And then right in between those size wise, you have pike like here, 15 to 25 pound pike, and you're getting action throughout the entire day. You're not fishing for one fish, you're fishing for maybe a dozen fish a day. And that makes it just so much fun. And also when you're using basket, I'm just using heavy bass gear to catch these pike. I mean, this is just, it, it, it's truly, they're truly, you know, a bucket list trip if you're looking for lots of action and big pike. Oh, oh. there we go. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Wow, wow. Ooh, ooh. Boy, she really came up and lunched it. Yeah. Come here, little whippersnapper, you. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Wow. Wow, look at that one there, Troy. Yeah. That's a good good one there. Look at him. Come here. Come here. Come here, buddy. Whoa. Whoop, no, 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 no. Whoa. Here we go. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. No. Whoa. There you God. go. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I tell you one thing. We've had one stellar day on the water. The first day at Gull Rock, staying yeah. at Five Lakes Lodge, we've been, this is like, how many of this, how many of these have we caught today? Oh, no. <laughs> what? A lot. Yeah, a, a lot, a lot. I mean, look, look at the size of this little animal. You wanna get in on some really fabulous fishing, you come up and fall to Northwest Ontario, sunset country, at Gull, we're staying at Gull Rock up in, Red Lake, Ontario, and it's just amazing. I mean, it has been just like an amazing day on the water. Troy, what do you think about it, Troy? Oh, this is just some of the best <laughs> pike fishing. It really, it had. really it's is. It's incredible. It's the hottest pike fishing I've seen in a long, long time. It's a lot of nu uh, numbers. <laughs> numbers, numbers of fish like this. Let, we'll get her back in the water. Beautiful, beautiful fish. Wow. Wow. That is so oh. much fun. Oh. <laughs> you got me a little wet. But it was worth it. <laughs> there you go, thank you. 
Hey, we all know about the crazy real estate market that we've been living in and seeing the last few years. And I've got some close friends and family that are in the business. And uh, uh, they've been encouraging me, me to, to possibly entertain the thought of selling my house. And I've got a big home. My wife passed away about almost 10 months to the day now, very close to it. You know, and I've been thinking seriously about downsizing, getting a new location, simplifying my life. And I looked at 14 different places, different locations, and I just couldn't find anything that I was comfortable with. And they keep nudging me, Al, you could make a killing. You could make a killing on your house. And uh, 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 I was sitting in my prayer time not too long ago in the morning, and I had two major criteria that I talked to them about that are important to me. One of them was convenience, convenience to town, not far from my office, my church, the food, theater, uh, anything uh, that, that uh, uh, I have to get to quick and easy. That was important to me. And the other part of it was solitude. I want some acreage, I want some space around, er, around me. And uh, those were two important factors. And in my time talking to the Lord, I'm complaining a little bit in the morning. Why can't I find where I'm going through it? Should I do the sort of, and it's like that little tug. You know, it wasn't an audible from heaven kind of deal. It says, why don't you just look out your window? Duh, a wake up call. Why don't you just look out your window? Well, I looked out my window. I thank God and I am here. I'm guessing for duration. <laughs> and simple truth, simple thing that I had to deal with, but uh, 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 it gave me great peace. Al, look out your window. Thank you, Father. You bless me so much, and my home and place I live is one of them. Hey, from all of us here at the edge of good, safe fishing season, we'll see you on the water. We're getting on the board, bro. Oh. Warming up a little bit, and so am I. <laughs> I'll warm up more when you put this one in the boat. Yes, I hear you. We'll warm that net up. Looks like what we come up here for, Billy. Yes, sir. Yeah. Nice one. Not a giant, but a nice one. Oh, we'll take her. Yeah. We're on the board. Nice. That puts us on the board. I spot locked on here. Hey, I'm in one of my favorite places in a whole wide world to fish. Beautiful Lake Vermilion in, up in northern Minnesota. And I'm fishing with a longtime friend of mine, Billy Rosner, who guides up here, who put the first one in the boat. Not a bad one for a warm up fish. And uh, I'm going to be up here for a few days. It's the first frontal passage of the year. And we've had about three days of 25, 30 mile an hour northwest winds, water temperature dropping like a rock. And uh, usually I come up here and fall the fish with Billy for a couple days and we fish some walleyes preferably. Oh, we might do a little crappie fishing, we talked about that. We've been up here over the years, musky fish, fish smallmouth up here, a great lake for that, big crappies, big bluegills. It's just one of those special lakes. And I think. Nice eater, nice eater. I dumped one a little before that. We're on a bike going, Billy. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves. Adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. I've been guiding up here for 20 plus years on Vermillion. I spend my most of my season up here and uh, I guide multi-species, you know, I start my season out with the walleye, maybe a little crappie, I do a lot of pike fishing, a lot of bass fishing, some musky fishing, and Vermillion's just a great multi-species lake, and as you go through the seasons, the bite kind of changes on all the species, but, uh, you know, as far as, you know, the, the, the large mouth, small mouth, uh, like I was saying, all the species, it's just a great all-around lake to fish year-round. I'm the guide today. 
I'm the guide today. How does that feel? Man, that feels good. <laughs> that feels pretty good, Al. Not a monster. You're not used to yeah. just an eater? Yes, the one of those a nice lake for a million walleye. <coughs> oh, well, maybe it's a little better than I thought. Maybe she grew up a little. Yeah. An original, yeah, original this, jig and wrap is doing its job, man. It? Yeah, it's just, just a nice, another nice eater. Yep. One of those fish everybody comes up here for. Yeah. I know we'd be poking around, you're gonna poke into a bigger one somewhere. But oh, yeah, you can yeah. almost flip oh, yeah. her. Yeah, I can almost flip yeah. her. Yep. Yeah. yeah, this is one of those nice vermilion eaters that everybody comes up here for. Like good dinner fish. These fish we've been catching just kind of shows you know the really nice year class of fish those really nice keeping size fish everybody likes to eat uh, the, since they put this slot on vermilion it's really helped this fishery out uh, you're allowed four fish under 20 inches everything between 20 and 26 has to go back and if you for some reason if you'd want to keep one you could keep one over 26 but those are really big trophy fish and it's best to release those and, and Everybody thinks, you know, vermilion is just a great fishing lake, but uh, you have to understand there's a lot of moving parts that makes this a great fishery. You got fisheries out of tower, uh, the DNR, they really manage this lake well with their netting and stuff. You got the Lake Vermilion Tourism Association, you got the Lake Vermilion Lake Association. Uh, there's many of us guides that work with the fisheries also and a lot of these private lake owners so th there's a lot of moving parts that really make vermilion a great fishing lake oh, bad just, one. A, just another just another one of them nice vermilion solid. solid eater she marked good this segment is brought to you by big bite baits designed to bring the big bite to your line Oh, bad just one. A, just another. Just another one of them. Nice for me. Solid. Solid eater. She marked good. I thought we had one of those really good ones. Yeah. Going that chicken wrap's been working really, really good. This lake is a really, really good jig and wrap lake. Uh, one of the things that I really like, you know, about vermilion, is the different ways that you can catch fish. Like I said, it's a good jig and wrap. Lake, but you can do anything you want. Look at this. That's, Isn't that sweet? This is what we call a nice guide mess here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you could uh, a cork fish, you could lindy rig fish, uh, you, 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 you could troll lead, le, lead core, you can pull boards, uh, you could jig with plastic, you can jig with right. jigging wraps. It's one of those unique lakes that are set up with many, many different patterns. Right now, the jigging wrap bread and butter. We ain't got a big gal yet, but we're going to get one. You know, fishing these original jigging, these jigging wraps, I like using mono, you know, and then that fluorocarbon leader. And uh, you just get that stretch or uh, shock, you know, and that just uh, helps hook more fish, I feel like. I had a real learning experience with my son Troy earlier this year. Uh, we did a television show and uh, we're, we're fishing deep pumps similar to some of the stuff we're doing today. And they were, we were really pounding them really good. And uh, we got on uh, a deep water bite and, and, and Troy had eight fish before I could conditions. blink. You know, and I'm fishing through them. Now, I was fishing the, the new uh, a wrap of a, sh a, a jigging shadow wrap. Bigger bait, different bait, different kind of action than the initial wrap -a. He had eight <laughs> fish behind me. When they stayed and I'm trying to think, I'm watching the action, I'm watching everything he's doing to match it up. And, and then I realized oh, yeah, no, he's, he's fishing his That's with braid and I was with mono. I immediately put braid on and like the third cast, I caught a fish and then it commenced to catch him for the rest of the day. The bait fish differs. And we were in anywhere from 22 to, oh, as deep as 32. And it was a real learning experience in that bait, at that time, in that situation, however we were moving that bait, it, it was different and you, it had to be fished with a, a, a braid, braided line. I mean, we, this bait is still in its infancy to try to understand all of the nuances 
uh, of it. It's got a different kind of action, a different kind of everything. So we're going to have a season of learning and more people fishing it, the more input we're going to get. But it definitely has a, a fit into this style or family uh, of baits. Well, here's a, another nice one, Al. You are, you are on fire, brother. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what we got. But... Not sure on size? No. You've been uh, tricking me, so I got to come back and get the net. They're in between. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's a monster. Oh, yeah. Nice one. Real nice one. Real nice bat. Much, yeah, very nice. Oh, cool. <clears throat> There you go. He's got the right jig for the jog right now. I'm trying to play catch up. Man, I, I love fishing on Vermilion in the fall. Al and I have been doing this quite a few years and we always have, you know, catch a lot of really nice walleye, smallmouth. We get into some crappies once in a while. It just uh, can't beat Vermilion in the fall. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. So that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins. I've been really having good luck today with this. Parrot number nine jig and wrap. Uh, it's, you know, the nine's a little larger, pro, the, the little bigger one. And uh, as you can see, it's a little breezy out. And Al's running the trolling motor. We're marking fish. He's, he's holding us on the fish with spot lot, a lot. And, and I'm just driving this thing into the bottom. I'm just pounding it. It's just bouncing off the bottom. And when I come up off the bottom, boom, there's a fish there. So, I mean, it's definitely been a pattern that's been working today. It's a flipper. I got her. I got her. Oh, she flipped right in the boat. Just the way I like them. <laughs> yeah. This is what what you fill fill up, fill the freezers with. I don't know if I want to clean anything tonight. We're gonna eat in a restaurant. There's restaurants all over this area. That's the other thing up here. I don't know what how how many resorts are on Vermilion, but there's a bunch. And and they take care of tourists. I mean, you come up here. And I don't care what kind of fish, what time, time of year you're coming here. There's good eating places. There's resorts that fit anybody's budget. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those special places that services any, uh, uh, any fisherman or vacationer looking for some, someplace special, any of their needs. It's a special lake and a special place. It's got all of the facilities that you can imagine. Yeah, yeah you know, we've been coming. I'm just changing my track nice. line. A little better. A nice one. I'll let you know. We ain't getting them a real big one yet, no, which is not kind yet. of surprising. I'll let you bet it. No, that ain't a flipper. That's a that's little bigger than a flipper. There you go. That's nice. Just a very nice one. Very nice one. Look at my different track lines. I started going in on the brake line here. Then I followed around. You can see I'm zigzagging across different areas across this semi basin in here. And I just get different, different passes and we're catching fish, nudging. There's a lot of fish. Wind is pouring into this cut, and these fish are spread all out in here, and I just keep changing different angles. Another pretty, very pretty fish. That was another beautiful Lake Vermilion walleye. You know, you come up to Vermilion, if it's your first time up here, and uh, the lake, you know, it's almost 40,000 acres. It can be very intimidating. You know, uh, your, your best deal would be to, you know, hire a guide up here, get a hold of resorts. They have certain guides they might work with. You know, there's a bunch of guides up here. The resort will get in the best direction. Get out here, learn the pattern for whatever season you're up here, what baits are working well. And, uh, you know, just get used to the lay of the lake up here. And, uh, That'll go a long ways to make your trip more enjoyable. You know, Lake Vermilion is a Canadian shield lake. That means it's got a lot of rocks in it, lots of them. And uh, uh, some of these spots that we're fishing, when you get out on these humps, and these lakes are loaded with high spot humps, and you get on the top of them, and they're usually pretty darn rocky. 
So you want to run them with your electronics and find out that transition area where the rocks end and it turns to softer bottom, in a lot of cases sand, like we're on now. And these fish will come in and spread over some of these areas or lay real tight on that transition where those big boulders end and it turns into a soft bottom or in many cases sand. And uh, those are killer spots up on these lakes. If you don't know where to fish that jig and wrap, you're gonna go, oh my gosh, you better, you better have a whole lot of them if you're fishing them wrong. Oh, I missed one, I missed one, Billy, I missed one. This is a little deeper run there. And uh, uh, interesting, the best we've been doing today, we're doing a lot of vertical fishing. A lot of times I can cast it away from, away from the boat and you're better off. You can look at your uh, Omega Live and see some fish over here and you cast to them. In there. But today it seems like that vertical, staying as vertical as you can and pounding the bottom, just pounding it. You know, and all of a sudden the fish is there. Today it's been a real good vertical day and sometimes you can pull, sometimes you can, you know, cast, which I like to do in a lot of cases. Just something to think about when you come up on a lake like this. No, just a, another keeper, you know, a good eating fish. Oh, I almost flipped him. You need the net, Al. Yeah, yeah, I do. All right. I'll yeah, it's there. a good one. A good one. It's what we get right on that corner. But I said we usually get them. I'm coming. It's not a big one, but it ain't a bad one. Nice keeper. Better? No. Get get her, slide them back. Her. Slide them back. <laughs> you got her? Yep. Whoa. <laughs> Just another, another eater. Yeah, you know, there's a bunch of them down there. You know, if you can get the big one to bite. This has been really kind of crazy. You look, most of the boats here right now, like these guys, they're, they're trolling lead core. And uh, they're working these big, massive flats. And we're fishing structure fish. And uh, uh, we could see them down here. These are spots Billy and I had fished before. Good jig and wrap spots, deep spots. But uh, you were catching fish, we're catching fish, we just can't get the monsters. And talking to these guys, you, you know, they're, they're getting, you know, a couple good fish a day pulling lead core. And we're not geared up for that. So we keep doing what we're doing and, and hoping to set on one of them big ones. We are loaded for bear. We got you know, bikes. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rods on the planet. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about. These die with drag. We got walleye stuff. We got crappie stuff. We got pike stuff. Most of my walleye fishing is done with an Icon Walleye Series rods from St. Croix. The rod I use a lot of is a 7-1, medium power, moderate, fast action. Uh, they got other actions as far as a 6-6, there's a 6-8. They have something for any kind of uh, a jigging style bait or rigging style bait uh, uh, that you might be interested in fishing that's comfortable to you. But this is one of my favorite. This is a jig and wrap rod made for this style of fishing. My favorite spinning reel for this kind of fishing is, is the Daiwa. Fuego 2500 series, and I spool it up with eight pound test, advanced suffix mono, and then I got a, a, a fluorocarbon leader, eight pound test, suffix. Flipper? Yeah, yeah, I can flip it. Yeah, flipper. Another flipper. But there's a few in this area there here. There are, yep. We've got a few hanging around here, Billy. Yeah, like we're talking, Al, you know, it's just interesting. I mean, it, we've caught loads of these, and those big fish, this, you know, there, there's a couple on this structure, but they're all out in that open water. You know, there's a bunch of boats along, long line trolling and lead corn, and everything's just uh, two weeks behind, you know, the water temperatures are 60. I mean, you look at the shoreline, the, the trees, aren't really, you know, not even 50% turned yet. So 
you know, you come out here in another couple of weeks, that water temperature gets down to that low 50s, 50 degrees, this whole game's gonna change with those fish starting to relate to more of this shallower structure. This is one of those time frames where you're just coming into the turnover where the fish are doing a lot of different things. You've got deep water fish, you've got some structure fish, you've got some night fish. Yeah, you know, they're really mixing it up. Uh, you can catch a lot of fish or a decent amount of fish like we're doing, but the big fish aren't coming easy. Yeah, you know, they're spread spread out. And, uh, some, of the, some of the lead core trollers are getting some of them. You know, as soon one. as the right. turnover settles yeah, out, yeah, you know, those fish will start coming off of these basins and start walleye. coming on structure like, we're, like we normally have them this time of the year. Oh, oh God, I missed them. You know, we're getting a lot of fish and, and some decent fish, but yeah, you know, you like to end the show like this with a big fish. I like to do that, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Most people would be very happy with this in most conditions. I guess maybe we're spoiled, Billy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you said it, Al. You know, so many times I've had people send me emails, a letter, ask me at church outreach programs, talk to me at sports shows and stuff that follow the closings on our show. And uh, they often say, I got a hard time understanding the Bible. You know, a lot of it just doesn't make sense to me. Well, welcome to the club. <laughs> There's a whole lot of it that, that doesn't make sense in a lot of cases because we're not quite capable of understanding a lot of it. Let me read a scripture to you that really addresses that issue. And I, I've got, I got the, the Passion Bible here, I got the New King James here, but this one explained it a little clear. It's the Message Bible. And it was so simple and so clear. This is Solomon, who was considered the wisest, richest man that ever lived. This is in uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 16 and 17. When I determined to load up on wisdom and examine everything taking place on earth, I realized that if you keep your eyes open day and night without blinking, you'll never figure out the meaning of what God is doing on this earth. Search as hard as you like, you're not gonna make sense of it. No matter how smart you are, you won't get to the bottom of it all. <laughs> that said so much, it makes it so simple. And what I mean by simple, don't complicate it. And the word of God is built around your personal faith. He's moved by faith. This is faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith-filled prayer is what moves them. Not vain repetitions or that, it's faith-filled prayer. Do you believe what you're saying? Is it coming from your heart, not from your head? When you have faith-filled prayer, God answers it. Don't try to make sense out of it because you're not gonna make sense out of it. And here, I found this, this so enlightening for so many people. Just read, you're not gonna figure it out. I don't care how, how smart you are. Uh, 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 there's things in God's word that you're not gonna figure out. It's a God deal, not you. God is God and you and I are human flawed in so many ways. However, we have access through him. We have access to his word to tell us how to live a faith-filled life and make life a whole lot easier in all of the circumstances that we face in this world we live in today. I thought that was a great read and I just wanted to share it with you. Hopefully it makes your day like it made mine. And from all of us here at the edge, you have a good fishing season. See you on the water. You can see that this is a big boulder and that's a bass right there. Those are two bass that are sitting next to the rock right there. And you can see the way they're moving around when you sit, put the mega live on a fixed spot and you actually look at it, got him. There he is, I got a good one. There he is. There you go, James. There he is. Oh, there's a better one. Yep, there you go. 
Not a giant, but he's got buddies with him. Wow, holy mackerel. He's really giving you the business. I'm telling you, no, I'm telling you, there's some real whippersnappers out here, and this is not even a real giant, but there's some ones in here that'll get your attention. Wow, look at that. Okay, Boy, I think we got him on the last, <laughs> the last. <laughs> Oh, there you go, there you go. Come here, buddy. There you go. Nice, James. There you go. It's not a giant, but a really nice smallmouth. Look at that nice. beautiful fish. Come here, buddy. Can you get my drop shot sinker yes, out of there? Come here, we'll get her back in the water pretty quick. She came, didn't come out of particularly really deep water. Came out about 12, 15, 14 foot of water. But look at that beautiful bass. Look at the color of that thing. Come here, buddy. Wow, that was fun. No question about it. A beautiful summer day. You know, right now, Jeff Simpson and I are fishing for one of our favorite fish, and it's the smallmouth bass. Both of us had the good fortune to fish all over North America fishing for smallmouth bass. I mean, we're talking Canada, Southwest, down in Arizona, the Columbia River, uh, the Missouri River, the Great Lakes, even into the Mid-South Reservoirs. And what we're gonna talk about is understanding the nature of smallmouth bass and how to become more of a proficient smallmouth bass fishermen, particularly focusing on finesse fishing. Right now it's midsummer. it's really prime time for doing this on deep water structures and we're going to talk about this and it's really a gas for catching numbers of really big brownies. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. You know it's, it's really awesome and interesting over the last 20 years just to watch how the, the smallmouth population has grown and expanded across the country. And not only do they have the populations gotten larger, the fish are getting bigger. And you're talking, boy, back in the day, if you caught a four pound smallmouth, you really had something. Well, you know, those, those fish are all over the place and, and we're talking even bigger fish. You know, the, the six, seven, eight pound smallmouth. So, oh, there's one, no little sir. one, James. No size? No. No. Well, he gained. Maybe he was just joking. Better? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Getting bigger? He got bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something ate the first one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's that. Ooh, that's a bad one. 41, huh? There, there's one right there too. He's gonna give up. Maybe jump in the boat. <laughs> what did he nibble on? He hit the little tube there, James. <sighs> Bass, they get bigger than that. That's a good, a good start, a good indication. We're on some fish here. James has got us on the fish on the boulders. Cool. I was just throwing this little tube. You know, there's a lot of these these finesse baits. This is a little smaller proportion tube. And James is doing the drop shot thing. You know, throughout the day, fish will show a preference towards one, one finesse bait or the other. So it's good, it's a good idea for the anglers to be using different baits, that's for sure. This segment is brought to you by Sunset Country, Ontario, Canada. You gotta come visit. Oh, 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 that's a better one there, I think. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> yeah, man, come here. Yeah, I don't know. Whoop, yep, that could be a better one. Ooh. Oh, that was my all trucks making the boil there. I thought it was the fish. Big boy, I think we need a net. Where is he? Oh, wow. Ooh, Ooh. there's a good one. There you go. Come here. Wow. Come here. Come here. Wow, that's James. a goodie. Nice and, nice and, yeah. That's a good one. Oh, look at that. James. Guy there. That's Ooh. A, 
There you go. Bring him. Bring, bring that little runt into the right into the pen. <laughs> wow. Wow. Look at that guy there. Beautiful smallmouth bass. You know, one of the real keys to becoming a really good smallmouth bass fisherman, as you said, is understanding the nature of the fish. You know, these fish actually spawned, you know, when the water was like in the 58 degrees in spring, 55 degrees along the perimeter of the shallow gravel and rock spines around the lake. Uh, but this particular lake actually has a lot of deep water forage. Let me get her back in the water. This lake also has a lot of uh, tulabies or ciscos. And uh, what happens is, you know, aside from eating crayfish, a lot of these fish actually target this uh, deeper water pelagic forage, particularly the really large ones. And what they do is they move out to these uh, secondary humps and deep water uh, reef systems in the center of the lake so they can actually access this deep water forage. And that's what we're doing today is actually deep water smallmouth fishing. And they're not deep water, like deep reef fishing. It's really prime time throughout the summer in many lakes, you know, but it's not in all lakes. It depends on the given body of water you're in. In some lakes, actually, they, they're crayfish-based lakes, and the fish don't move that much. I mean, they can actually live their entire life on a couple of block area. They'll spawn and live on shallow reefs, you know, on shallow crayfish-based lakes, but like lakes we're in here, where you have a lot of that deep water forage, whether it be rainbow smelt, ciscos, tulby, shad, they do a lot of movement and a lot of times what they'll do is set up on these deep water shelves in the fact that they can access the, that uh, larger food or larger forage, which in this case happens to be tulabies. <laughs> I know they're strong at this time of the year. You get in this warm water, boy. He's gonna... Yeah. They're super juiced. Super juiced. Wow. I know, where's, right? he, where's he going there, big boy? I don't boy? know. You don't... I've never been spooled. There's always a first. <laughs> <laughs> wow, angry. He's angry. The boy, I got another one right underneath yeah, the boat. Yeah. I got another one right underneath the boat here. Catch him. Wow. You need the net on that little runt? Yeah, I suppose. Oh, there you Let's go. See. That's a good one. Come here. Where is he? There you go. That's a good there one. There you go. That's James. Thank you, sir. That's finesse fishing. At its finest, right there. And you know, and a lot of you know, there's a lot of power fishing tactics with crankbaits. But you know, a lot of the really good bass fishermen who fish tournaments, guess what they're doing? They're finesse fishing, and that is the deal most of the time. Nice fish. You know, Jeff, you're absolutely right about that. You know, well, power fishing techniques with top water uh, jerk baits, crankbaits can work in these conditions at times. When you look at professional bass tournaments that are held uh, throughout the Midwest and in many places around the country, most of the time, multiple tournament or multiple day tournaments, it's dominated with various types of finesse techniques. And what I'm talking about finesse, it could be everything from a, a, a Nico rig, a drop shot rig, a tube, uh, a Ned rig are really some of the primary presentations to catch lots of big smallmouths out of moderate to deeper water fishing situations throughout the summer months. We are loaded for bear. We got you know, there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rods on a planet. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these Daiwa drags. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. Ooh, man. Yep, there you go. Now you're talking. Now oh, you're talking. Yeah. Oh, man. Wow, what do you got there, Mr. Simpson? We got a beautiful day for in the neighborhood. Jimmy special. That's a Jimmy special. Yeah. This is my favorite activity. These weather conditions we got right now are just perfect for this. You can because you can fish so accurately, you know what I mean? With yeah. every different aspect of your electronics, everything from your finding them, you know, to go like, identify those specific spots on the humps, as well with Mega Live and 2D sonar. You can actually see so well, you know what it I mean? Is, it you know, is really it, nice. I'm back here watching your, your sonar units back here, watching the side imaging. You're up there with the mega. It's really fun. Oop, coming up again. Whoa, come here. Ooh, there, he there we go. No, not a, a giant, but that's a good one there. That's a come good here. one, yeah. That's a good one. Thank you, James. It's, oh, a, nice. it's a pretty one. Cool, cool. Uh, I'll awesome. get you. 
I'm such a nice guy, I'll even get you the pliers. Do you even need such a thing, or you just pop it right out? Yep, got them. Cool, and that was on the two and a half inch salty tube. Nice again, huh? Cool fish. Awesome. That's all cool. You know, James just pulled up on that spot and bam, caught that fish. But we didn't just pull up on that spot. We did a lot of recon before this and went around and identified the spots and then really identified the key spots. So pretty cool. VMC makes a wide variety of different delivery systems for finesse fishing. Today we're employing four of our favorite tactics. First, the VMC Nico hook rigged on a drop shot rig with a tungsten drop shot cylinder weight. This light wire finesse hook has a positive hooking design and the tungsten sinker transmits bottom composition better than lead sinkers. Next up is the VMC tube jig, which is rigged internally in the tube. This style of rigging works well in zebra mussel infested water or really rocky conditions. It simply doesn't get snagged up that much. Third, we have the VMC hybrid swim bait jig. This has a spring keeper for securing soft plastic swim baits. This system really makes your swim baits far and away more durable. Last but not least is the VMC Ned Rig Jig. This jig has a good collar to hold soft plastics in place and a hybrid hook gap design for positive hookups. The 90 degree line tie works well for bottom dragging presentations like Ned Rigging. Keep in mind these presentations are relatively slow moving, so finding the right spots on these structures with your electronics is imperative. As Jeff and I were talking about earlier, one of the biggest things is do some amount of reconnaissance with your depth finder. And, uh, both, I'm actually working with two different really key features. One is the map and number two is side imagery because what we're going to do is we're going to spend some amount of time driving around these underwater structures, making back and forth passes and dropping coordinates down off of side imagery which ultimately shows up on my map. And as you can see, we have some isolated boulders here. And what I'm looking for is very, very distinct things. The largest boulders. I'm looking for really distinct ledge drops. I'm looking for uh, high ridges of, of rocks. Like right here, you can see that there's a bunch of rocks out to my left here, out in deeper water. Exit, let me get this up on my other unit. See out here, and I'm gonna actually scroll over. Mark, mark, exit, and then it actually shows up on my map. And you do some amount of time, I mean, this is worth its weight in gold because you can quickly identify the absolute best spots in short order. And you can see what happens. We're on an inside corner and this boulder ridge swings in here, but I'm looking for a couple of different things. You know, one, if you find those really large rocks are really key. But also, so are some, some things like this when you got these hard to uh, uh, soft bottom transitions. You can see where these boulders transition into the sand. Again, I'm gonna mark the edge of that. So when I come back and fish over, when Jeff and I fish back over the spot, we're fishing the absolute best spots on this point and where the fish are most apt to be positioned. That's the real key. He's coming for it. Got him, big one. There we go. Oh, there he is. Wow. <laughs> Boy, what's really interesting, see that boulder right there? That's where that fish came off of, and you can see that there's more fish sitting there right here, right on that boulder. Wow, look at the size of that little rascal. <laughs> Whoa, come here. Wow. This is serious activities here. Whoa, come here, buddy. Come here, oop, where are you? Oh, there he is, oh, uh, there you go. Here. There you go. There we go. Nice. Just another one. Boy, there are every one of them. I mean, these fish, are, they look like they come out of a mold. Look at that. Come here, buddy. Let me get him off. It's a beautiful fish, though. Look at the color of that darn thing. Real beautiful animal. Come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. This boat is rigged up about, it's nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. So well, that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins.
See them right there? If you stay and sit there and watch, you'll actually see these. That's actually a bass right there. They're sitting by a bunch of rocks right there. This mega live or forward facing sonar has really revolutionized angling. It's sort of intriguing, you know, over the last number of years, it's amazing that how that this technology has really become dominant in just about every tournament in North America. And we're talking walleyes, muskies, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, crappies. It's just amazing. Come here. Oh, there you go. Come on. Oh, there. How do you like that? I know one thing. I'm absolutely sold on the Somali. The Somali worm. It's a little fine. This is a big, big bite. We were working, been working with big bite for a while, and they just brought this bait out, and it's actually sort of, it's made a, it's got to actually have some uh, scent in it. I really like those guys. Let me grab another one out of here. These are, uh, the bait I've been drop shotting with is called a, a Somali worm. And what's sort of interesting, it's relatively small. It's sort of a, really sort of a small bait. But the thing is, it's actually, it has a scent in it. And it's sort of intriguing in the fact a lot of smallmouth bass are often considered to be a very, very big sight feeder. But the thing is, with these really small profile baits, when the fish can come up and look at it, scent is a big deal when it comes to catching smallmouth bass. I don't know why when they come in really, you know, they get in close to the bait, they're looking at it and they actually get close enough and they can actually smell the bait and it makes a difference. Big Bite makes this a whole series of smallmouth bass baits actually and it's called Sensation. And we've been fishing it for the last couple of years and I've really done really well with this stuff. I, I really like it. You know, with all the presentations that have evolved over the years, rod companies have responded and created a whole line of rods specifically for those tactics. Now, when it comes to finesse fishing, that's even a lot of rods for there. I mean, I have three sitting here right here. The Legend Tournament Bass Rod, this is a swim bait, a swim bait rod. So that's specifically designed for swim baits. Next would be the another Legend Tournament, and this is called the Power Finesse. And that that James was using for the, he's been using for the drop shotting. And, and finally this, I got a victory rod here. And this one is Max Finesse. And this is uh, what I was using with, I've been using with the tube. So all these rods just have just beautiful actions. I've used a lot of rods over the years and there's nothing sweeter than using St. Croix. I can tell you that right now. You know, when it comes to uh, finesse fishing, I've actually ch uh, changed my tune over the last number of years. And as of recently, I've become a lot more sort of sold on bigger reels. And uh, this happens to be a Daiwa Ballistic MQ 3000 size reel. And you'll notice I got it spooled with a brilliant yellow line. This happens to be Suffolk's uh, 832 10 pound test braid. But what I like about this big, bigger reel is a couple of different things. Number one is the, uh, the larger spool size and the reason for that a lot of finesse fishing situations you want to be able to get a lot of line off the reel whether i meet casting a swim bait i'm drop shotting i want it to be able to get the bait back down to the bottom really quickly that's a larger spool affords you the ability to to really manage the line really easily you sure yeah it's you're sure, sure wow sure. you got a big one on there i, I think, think. So. Ooh, wow, oh, there you go. Wow. Eric, that's a real one there. That's what I was talking to you. That's, that's what one. you were talking now about, you're James. Talking, we're talking Woo. King Tut. <laughs> look, at that, look at that mule. That's what I was saying. I was out here oh, the other man. day and I caught like four or five of them, like this one here. Great big ones. No question about it. <laughs> when it comes to catching a lot of big brown bass throughout the warm water months, finesse is the way to go. The other thing is to do your homework with your electronics. Recently, I had a friend of mine that's just really getting into the things of God. He's been searching his whole life. He's starting to ask questions. He was with me at retreats and at church things, speaking engagements through the years along with my brother. And uh, uh, he had some problems in his, his life, was turned off to organized religion, a lot of that, that things. And now he's coming back around, coming back around, and he's searching. And he asked me, Al, I want to get into the Bible. I've never read the Bible. He says, I believe everything I'm hearing, but I need to know more. What Bible do I get? 
you know, and I did, you know, here, here, you know, I went through it. I got New King James, which I, I love. I like the Amplified. And the newest Bible that's out there is called the Passion Bible. It's the newest ver version. And I like the read. In, in it. So I suggested to him get this Passion Bible. It's the New Testament, it's Proverbs, Psalms, so Psalms, Songs of Solomon. And uh, I told him, first thing, thing I suggest you do, read the book of John. Have a marker with you or a pencil when you read it. And when you read something that really tugs at your heart a little bit, mark it, highlight it. More than likely, that's the Spirit of God talking specifically to you. And I said, when you get done with that, you, you, to know a little bit of what, what God says about living in the world that we live in, and that's a challenge by a long shot. I said, so, so go to Proverbs and read, read Proverbs, the bo book of wisdom. And it, it talks about daily living, wise counsel. And I would suggest that view. If, you, if you're somebody looking, you never read the Bible, get into it. It's a, gr a great read and, and it'll get you moving in the right direction. But I can't overemphasize, make sure you have something with you because God will talk to you. This is, these are not normal books. These are books, are the, the Bible is the inspired word of God. And when you read it and you feel that tug in your heart, that's God talking to you personally. He loves you, he cares about you, and he wants the best for you. Hey, from all of us here at the Edge, you have a good fishing season. See you on the water. Jimmy, I got one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cat, cat fever. We were messing with our microphones, and what happened? <laughs> It's not a monster, but it's a good one. There you go. Yeah. Pretty one. Oh, no. Jimmy, coming up at you. Come here, buddy. There we go. Oh, 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 come on, come on. There we go. <laughs> one on the board. Well, James Linder and I are on the Red River of the North, just sort of above Grand, uh, Grand Forks quite a ways, and we're uh, going for some midsummer catfish. Kind of one of Jimmy's favorite things to do in the summer is fish for cats, and I actually enjoy it too. And we got our first one on the board here. Not a bad fish, eh? No. All right, should we let this guy go? Going in. Whoop, there's one right there. There's another one, Mike. Mike, oh, oh. You got him? Yeah, there he goes. All right, there. there's <laughs> one. <laughs> Whoa. Well, then. Whoop, there's a real one there. <laughs> there's a real this one. A little better. Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a real <laughs> dog here. <laughs> Whoa. You know, every year we come up, this is one of my favorite fisheries. It really is a, such a unique body of wa water. It grows gigantic catfish. For anybody who has never experienced uh, this fishery, it's definitely worth the trip. It really is because this is one of those fisheries that you can actually, you know, over the course of a day, we'll catch literally hundreds of pounds of fish. And I'm not kidding you. I'm serious. It's just amazing. This is one of the absolutely the finest channel cat fisheries in North America. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. Uh, this year we had a really high water year, and what happens is this river runs north. It runs into Lake Winnipeg uh, by the Selkirk Dam. What happens when you have these really high water years, it pulls a lot of those big Canadian fish way up river, and that's what we got going on right now. But I do know one thing. It's fun catching these guys. <laughs> it's a serious, a serious bite. Come here, buddy. Boy, you are a tough little rascal. Come here. Oh, gosh. You know, one thing that's really vitally important about uh, catfishing in a river is being on the right line. And what I mean by that, we're still at relatively high water conditions. And as the water gets higher, the fish have the tendency to be pushed to the banks. As the water gets lower, they suck out into the main river channel. So what's really important is where you're anchoring. Right now, we're having to be spot locking, uh, but the, th the key is, is really being able to get on the right position. Getting on the right depth line is critical when you're chasing current-driven catfish. Water flow speed in any river can fluctuate day to day and hour to hour, and these fish will often reposition depending on many factors. 
When we first start out on a river, we often do some amount of driving and using our side imaging on the Humminbird to isolate current breaks, cover, and fish. This gives us a base point on a depth to start fishing. Once we set up and start catching fish at a particular depth, we want to replicate this in other spots as we fish our way down river. When you look at this graphic, you'll see what I mean. We make note, was the fish in the main river channel or was it on the next line shallow or moving toward shore? Or was it up on a flat very close to shore? Simply, these are what we refer to as lines. Replicating the right line is critical to predicting the right depth you want to be set up on when you are moving spot to spot down river. Obviously, we take into consideration, were the fish at the head of the hole or on the tail end? Were they on a run or a corner bend? These are complex topics for another episode. This is a classic catfish rig that we fish all over North America, actually in Central America. Uh, I've used this exact same rig. Uh, this is a five ounce sinker. This is really based on the, the speed of the current. We have real heavy uh, current right now, so we're running fives. You'll notice that it's really important to have a bead when you're fishing these really heavy sinkers because this sinker slams against the, the uh, barrel swivel and you'll sort of mash the knot. But one thing that you'll notice, I have a six to eight inch uh, leader and then I have a uh, VMC uh, 9299 uh, octopus hook but I have really long uh, tag ends on each one of them. The reason is it's sort of hard to lock down this heavy monofilament. This is a Suffolk Siege 25 pound test of fluorescent orange, but what it does, it gives you a little bit of assurance and the catfish don't care. That's all I'm telling you. When you're really leaning on big fish, I know one thing coming up here, you learn how to fight big fish and you learn details about the technique that some things don't, get, you know, a lot of times, well, you have really clean knots and stuff like that. Catfish don't care, <laughs> they, they really don't. This segment is brought to you by Sunset Country, Ontario, Canada. You gotta come visit. Well, Jimmy, you got one over on that one too now. See, that's it. unbelievable. See, <laughs> we're dinking around trying to get Michael, the and we got another one. That's ni the nice thing about the circle, circle hook. Is he there? <laughs> yep, he's still there. They sort of hooked themselves and really rolled over hard. Yeah, good deal. I'm gonna get this and that. You know, we're fishing with both bait, bait casting and spinning spinning rod. The nice thing about the spinning rod, you're really fast. A lot of times these fish swim up really fast upstream. With the spinning reel like this, you can really pick up line really quickly. For some people, it's a lot easier to fight fish with a spinning rod where you can actually put it in your belly, you can dig it in. I know Al's really big on, on fishing with it. When we're fishing cats, he likes running a spinning rod. We moved twice. Got to the spot and boom, two fish. Yeah, but both of the spots were in the same line. They were. We're on the tail out of the hole, hole and just coming back up onto the flat. Oop. How are we doing here? Yep. Whoa. Ooh, Ooh, that's a that's nice a fish. One. That's, that's a like really your nice other fish. one was that same size. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, real, some real whippersnappers. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, you see, this is what I mean. It's like serious fun. I mean, this is like really fishing. Toe to toe. Oh, I'm not kidding you. If you've not, anybody who I've ever brought up here, and I've brought a number of different people the first time on the Red River, and they were immediately addicted. <laughs> says, let's go do that again because that's serious fun. Okay, there we go. I'm All gonna, right. I'm gonna Michael, get. Michael, we're on, we're on the down home stretch here. You're gonna get them above me, and Mr. I'm gonna net them going Cat. downstream. That's the key when you're netting fi big fish like this. What you can do is you have the downstream guy downstream of you, and then. He, the guy with the fish just walk forward towards the head of the boat. Okay. Hold on, up a little more, Jimmy. Uh, got him. He's in. Hey, there we go. Ooh. Holy, that's a workout. This yeah, is I tell a, you that. That was a, that was a real workout. This is a big thicky. <laughs> it's a big. It's a big thicky. Ready? Coming yep, in. There you go. That's <laughs> a tank. That's a horsey in of a horse. Look, look at that guy. A big tubbo. <laughs> yeah. Look at that beautiful fish. Michael, you're right about that. This guy here is a real wide. He is just a wide. Load. Real wide body. Yeah, nice. That's fish. why you come to the Red River of the North. Giant channel cats and lots of them. Sometimes you catch two, three hundred pounds of these little rascals a day. And it's beautiful weather, flat calm, and catching <laughs> whoppers. All right, so today we're catfishing wow. on the Red River, and we've got Whoa. a couple of different types of rods going. We've got uh, big heavy bait casting equipment and some little bit moderate heavy 
um, spinning tackle, um, seven foot rod, eight foot rod. But the one key you want to have when you're fishing for catfish is a fast action rod. A uh, good bite detection on the tip, and then the power of the rod depends on how big a fish you're fishing for. So like this rod here, for instance, is a extra heavy power. This would be a good rod, eight foot extra heavy, a great rod if you're fishing for big, huge blue cats or these big channel cats. Now the spinning rod, on the other hand, is down to a medium heavy power and seven foot long. So this still, um, can handle the catfish we're fishing, but I wouldn't fish for giant blues with it. But, uh, but the power of the rod is dependent on how big a fish you're fishing for. As far as the bait casting reel, I have a Daiwa Lexa Win. This is a 5.1 gear ratio reel. It's got that really big school. We got pretty heavy line and it got really big line capacity. One thing that we're doing is taking these big sinkers on this bait casting rod and throwing it a long distance away from the boat. Michael's got one of our buddies on. I just got bit, Jimmy, and while you were talking, I didn't want to disrupt nice, you, but... Nice. Okay, no, that's all quite all right. He's leaping on top out there. I did your little trick. I saw it going, and I reeled down to him in the rod holder, rod holder. before I set the hook and made sure the hook was in him. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, Michael, you know the type of guy I am? <laughs> I'm putting the bait back out since he's back you in are. range. <laughs> but I'm going to throw it way out there. There, there you go. This is a really nice reel. This is a Procyon, Daiwa Procyon. This is a 4,000 size reel. It's got really high speed pickup, big spool capacity for heavier line. This is almost 25 pound test line. And then it's got that really fine drag. You really need that for these guys here because these dogs pull. So that was cool. I saw that tip, that fast tip, just start bending over and give enough to where I couldn't tell there was a fish on there. Whoa. I think we got another decent one here, don't you? They're, they're all decent. I know. That's what I mean. That's what they. That's the weirdest thing about this fishery because they average so big. I mean, like small ones are like ten pounders. You know yeah, what I mean? Right. And, yeah. Yeah. You know. You don't uh, see them because it's only no four inch clarity here. Yeah. It's sort of weird how these fish can. Ooh, boy, he's a darky. Yeah, big male. Oh, there Good you job. go. All right. See that scoop. Oh, uh, holy, nice. holy mackerel. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Boy, two man lift, it's isn't a, it? Yeah, he's another serious animal. Oh, Jay Hook. Oh man, this thing was way bigger than I thought it was going to be. Holy mackerel, they about smash your hand when you're <laughs> when lifting you, them up. <laughs> yeah, you're you, right. It's, it's when you cool. put your thumb in their mouth, you, they'll definitely get your attention. So that was on a number eight Shadrach. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. Do you want to be able to see in the water? The adventure begins. We are loaded for bear. We got you know, there's so many different ways to fish for walleye. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rods on a planet. Boat control is so important for any fishing situation. And with cats, it's no different. Today, we're using the Minkota Tarova to spot lock us and hold us in place in the main thrust of the current. These motors have changed the game for cat fishermen. The days of carrying a 40 pound anchor around are a thing of the past. They will keep you pinned in the heavy current and allow those baits to soak in one spot and not being pulled around by boat sway. When we get into shallower water situations, the talons are invaluable. They pin you in place with almost no lateral movement. And this will save you some battery juice if you can use them. The fact is, you really need to have both to be an efficient cat fisherman, no matter where you fish. So you hear a lot of talk about Mega Live, and most anglers have theirs mounted on the bow mount trolling motor. Well, I happen to be running an 1875 Pro Guide here, and I decided with the Vantage on the back to mount the Mega Live to the, to the Vantage on the back of the boat. So if you do a lot of fishing from the back of your boat, like a lot of tiller guys do, um, it comes in handy for that, so you're actually backing into the fish. But right here, we're anchored, spot locked in this spot, and we're using it to look for fish behind us. So we got our catfish rod all in the back, 30 to 60 feet back, and I can set this up to scan 30 to 60 feet back and look for moving fish. So as we've been fishing here today with our other setup, I got a side imaging here and 2D sonar, we've got this graph set up to do mega live so we can look to see if there's fish in the area. So you might, oh, this rod's going right here. You got one on there, Jimmy, right now it's on. So you got him? Okay. Yep. 
So basically, we can scan side oh. to side looking for whoa, fish, whoa, moving fish there. around to know if there's fish in the area. It's a pretty cool deal. I'm going to get this guy out of your way here. I'm sorry. That was exactly what I meant. That, that fish, that, that fish uh, swam forward, uh, uh, yeah. forward with it. I'm going to go get the net. There we go. I don't know how, what <laughs> oh, side. Oh, there's one Wait. on this one, too. Wait, you got another one on. There we go. Double header. Get him. Get him, Michael. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, <laughs> there you go. Uh, we're doubled up. Here, I'm gonna net your fish. Now, now we're talking, this is Red River. <laughs> this Where's is your the, fish? the Red River. This is exactly what I mean. Sometimes we've been out here at night. If you had four lines out, you can't put four lines in the water because you'll have, have uh, fish on all of them. Yeah, we gotta get this guy aboard here, Michael. I can't there see him. There yeah. we go. Here's your, here's your <laughs> fish. Yeah, okay. Here, okay. I'm gonna give you this net. Yep, gonna, I got it. Take oh. this guy here. Hope we, there we go. He forgot okay. he was hooked. But now we got him. Okay. Whoa, look at this guy going nuts. What size is he? Uh, nice. A nice? Not giant. Oh, he just popped off. Okay. But we still had, we had a double header going there. Oh, come here. Almost a double header. Ooh, boy, there's a pretty one. Look at that guy there. Pretty snout. Really pretty fish. Look at that. That's a female there. It's got that sort of uh, more sharper nose to her. We'll get her back in the water. All right, so that was sort of unfortunate. We almost had a double there. Um, so I've lost two fish today, and coincidence or not, both fish were on a J hook. Now, you know, usually when you get a catfish hooked, it's hooked good, but we've had uh, both circle hooks down and J hooks down, and the two fish we've lost have been on the J hooks, whereas the circle hooks, every single one's in the corner, right? I mean, yeah. they just pin them good, so. Oh. Coincidence or not, but that was the kind of an interesting thing. Both fish we lost were on the on the J hooks. So. You know what that tells me? What does that tell you? It tells me that when you're we're using too small a J hooks, we got to go up to the nine two two six. You go to the bigger hook. That's a smaller hook. You got to go to the bigger hook because these fish have such big jaw structure. You need the hook to match the size of the jaw structure of the fish you're fishing. If you're too small a hook, you can't get around there, around the jaw to hook them correctly. Yeah. Good point. Really good point. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these die with drag. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. You know, some of the important tools to have in the boat, in any boat for that matter, is uh, what I got here, a cutting, cut, good cutting board, good pair of pliers. This is a folding uh, knife. This is our bait knife. This is sort of nice, this is a heavy duty bait knife. You saw we were cutting pretty good sized suckers up. This really dispatches of them pretty quickly. Uh, this is one of my favorite hookout tools. This is a hookout disgorger. And of course, a good pair of scissors. These happen to be uh, Bubba bla uh, braid scissors, and these suckers are really, really sharp. But this is some stuff that we always have in the boat, uh, whether we're catfishing or not, I guess, you know. But these are definitely mandatory for catfishing, all of the above. He's, he's hooked. So. Whoa. Oh, geez, Jimmy. Oh, Michael, I think you got one on. <laughs> spinner, hey, I get to catch one on the spinner finally. Yeah. Ooh, you're well, going to have to give me a hand here. I'm, yeah, like, I'm, I'm with you. I'm crossing like I'm, every I'm, line I'm, over wow. here. Okay. I think we got a possibly a substantial fish on. Boy, how do you beat this for action? This is like great. It's, it's like two in the afternoon, bright hot sun. And, and they're biting <laughs> in a big way. <laughs> We're on a really good line in here, boy. I mean, we got it. It seemed like they're not quite in the deep core of the, the river. They're sort of like off on the inside of uh, corner bends, but we're just not quite to the center of the channel. So there's, we, but I know one thing, we're not definitely on the right, right line because all the spots where we've been catching them, they're, they're in the same spots. I think we're, cl we're clear of the rods. You managed to keep them all out, didn't you? I might do a switcheroo with you here to walk. To, you know, you're gonna have to move to the forward. I'll move yep. backward. Ooh. Ooh, you got a big pinky. They're my <laughs> favorites. <laughs> oh, you do, you got a great big, some of them, they got really beautiful colors. They almost get like a really pink wow. cast to them. Yeah, I can see you working up a sweat after catching a few of these there. Oh, Ooh, wow. Wow, look at that. Oh, oh, Michael. Did you, oh, oh, did you, I'm trying, I'm one, trying to go. I know, it's like, it's at the end of the scoop here. 
We're gonna get them this time. There you go. You. Oh. Ah, I'm okay. trying to there you go. go. Oh, there I got them. <laughs> The thing is, is when you get real big fish like this, one thing that's really important, rather than a lot of people leverage and use the whole net, what you want to do is just drop the net down and lift it straight, wow. straight, straight up. That like could that. be the biggest one of the day. Hey, that's a biggie. Holy yeah, it's mackerel. A, it's, you've got a big pinky, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> that's a be that's beautiful, I like when they get that pink cast on Yeah, look at that. Some of them I mean, are still a little ripped up from spawning. A little bit, to heal, yeah. Heal up, but boy, they're really beautiful fish. They're the so average cool. size up here is incredible. This is like it's been so much fun. So we're gonna we're gonna let her go. Back to the depths of the Red River. Hey, I got a special guest with us today. It's my friend Jeff Simpson. Jeff and I go way back to In Fisherman Communications Network when my family and I owned the business. We sold that, we got involved with Linder Media Productions and we produced the, started the Angling Edge television series and, and it's alive and well today and a number of other shows that we produce. And uh, Jeff is in charge of our social media area. He oversees the whole social media world that we live in today. And uh, when we do these closes like this, Dan Linder, my nephew, is on the camera, and Jeff have always been with me. And we pray over the opening and get a direction. We know what's right. We seek some wisdom on the stuff. And I ask him, is there anything on your heart that you might want to share with the viewers? And Jeff came up with something on his heart, and I'm going to just turn it over to you, brother. <laughs> well, thanks, Al. Yeah, the one thing I can think of that has helped me for decades is to really take conscious of and consideration for forgiving people and to forgive often, you know, and, and that was really handed to my wife and I before we got married. And boy, has that really paid big dividends for us in our marriage. Sometimes I step on her toes, she steps on my toes, but every day, like we start the day off fresh, we have, we forgive, forgive each other. And, and for people, you know, as we move along in, in life, you know, they're just people you, that we're humans. We're kind of a funny bunch, right? We, we, we step on each other's toes and we may offend each other. And, and some of those infractions can be bigger, you know, dealing with, with people as you go along in life. And, and so it takes a lot of effort for you, yourself to forgive somebody. And, and, but it's really, really, truly worth the effort. It, it's only gonna, the main person that's gonna benefit is you and me so I, I honestly go through the effort and and if somebody has offended me i will or, or hurt me in some way to go through that process of in my head and in with in my heart to forgive that person and it may take several several times and it may bubble back up and i i really work at forgiving and what that does is it eventually it will release you and those open wounds will heal you may still have those scars but but they're just scars and you don't feel that anymore so it's written right here in the bible matthew 18 21 through 22 then peter came to him and said lord how often shall my brother sin against me and i forgive him up to seven times jesus said to him I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven times per person. That's 500 times roughly. So, but it pays, it's, it's a gift from God to Amen. forgive people. Hey, simple words of wisdom that all of us have to deal with at some time in our life, multiple times. Hey, from all of us here at the Edge, have a good safe fishing season. Thanks for being with us. Let's head to South Dakota and catch some walleye. Sounds like a, a good plan. Wind, wind, wind. Every day it blows and blows and blows. I have never seen such crazy weather patterns as we're experiencing in my life here in Minnesota. In fact, all over the country. You know, thunderstorms like we had, massive rains last night, thunder, lightning, horrendous weather. Wind is blowing again like crazy. Oh, it made our filming business really tough. Not easy getting out in thunderstorms, wind, rain. We had, we're almost three to four weeks late season. I said, I've never seen a year like this. And the fishing generally, all the guides I know and people for different kinds of fish in the upper Midwest, muskies, walleyes, largemouth, smallmouth, crappie, everybody says it's a, pretty much a below average year. Naturally, you get windows of time, there's spurts of time, and we'll naturally always catch some fish. 
But when you got to get bit, I was talking to my son, Troy. I said, Troy, we got to get to, we got to get out. We got to break. We're going to go fishing anyway. He and I haven't been on water for a while. So let's go where I can get a bite. What do we do? We go for a largemouth bass. Why largemouth bass? We live in an area where there's a lot of lakes. Largemouth bass are the most popular game fish all over the country. They're the most adaptive. That you can catch them in tiny one-acre ponds to massive reservoirs and river systems. They adapt better than a smallmouth, a walleye, a muskie, a northern, uh, a crappie, than any other fish. They're all the way up into Canada. They're all over the world in different places. That's why they're so popular. And they bite on a wide variety of kind of baits. And when we got to get a bite here in Minnesota in a pukey day like this, I go largemouth fishing. Let's go get something dry. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves, adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. Oh, got him. That did not. Oh. All right. So that didn't take long. It was, we've been out about, I don't know how long, not long at all. I think I can swing this in even on the eight pound leader. A little Ned rig right through the top. Dad actually gave me the cue on that, saw it on the live imaging, and I told me kind of where, echo where to cast, drop down, and it bit. It's a good way to start the day. Part of them sitting right down there. See those, those are bass. The right, <clears throat> that's the deep edge of the weeds. Those are bass laying right along the edge of it that he's catching down and out. I'm, I'm mega live right in here. Ooh, good one, Troy. Yeah. Oh, good one, man. Ooh, cranking, cranking Rocco. <laughs> it's so much fun. Good way to start. Want a oh. net on this? Yeah, she's a good fish. Whoa. You want a net, or are you gonna flip it? I don't know. It? Let me, let me, let me, let me see. I think I can get her in. Oh, she ain't as big as I oh. thought she was going to be. But she's pretty decent. We'll, we'll take her. Just shy of, I think I'll do a grab on her. Just enough. Once she inhaled that Rocco. <clears throat> How's that? Nice chunky one. Well, we're here. We got two quick ones. I'm throwing the new OG Rocco from Rapple Up, and this has been a heck of a bait. Another home run for them for largemouth bass and smallmouth bass. I've really caught a lot of fish already this season on this thing. And it's like what we call one of their hero baits, and they don't come out with baits that ain't hero baits, and a Rocco is one of them. I'm sure this lake around, we're gonna catch some cranking, we'll catch some jigging, we'll catch some Ned rigging, we'll catch some uh, wacky, uh, we'll, we'll get them a variety of ways. We might even go do a little bit of punching. This segment is brought to you by Wavy Label Eyewear. Backed by a lifetime warranty, we see what others don't. I'm casting out to the end of this weed point. See this point here? here my boat's here. I'm casting along the side that's the boat, I'm casting along the side of those weeds, and I'm fishing. The bait is just tickling the top of those weeds. There's some of those fish that I'm seeing are right down on the bottom. Ooh, that cast there very well should be a fish. So we have the two screens here, so when I'm sitting in the back of the boat, I'm actually watching the forward sonar here in the live imaging, and I can see the edge of the weeds right here. I can see the fish kind of moving around there and also out away from the weed line. I also have the 2D sonar over here and then my map. So between these three, this gives me a picture perfect view of what's happening down and around the boat. Got him, good one. Right under the boat. Oh, yeah. Troy, right on. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> that was a, as if I was flipping. <laughs> I can see him laying down there. Yeah, you know, we got a, we got a couple fish cranking, we got a couple. Fish, fish, netting, and I don't, uh, you don't ever, ever 
coming to lakes that we fish up here without having a jig on. You, you know, it is day in and day out. It's tough, tough to beat. And uh, yeah, we're rigged with a variety of different kind of baits to cover the different kind of habitat that we're gonna be fishing on this lake today. You know, Minnesota's known, known as the land of 10,000 lakes. And I don't know how many of them got bass in them. The vast, vast, vast majority have largemouth bass. No, there's no question about that. And when we explore, which we do a lot, we look for, for new lakes to film on and, and just fun things to do. And the main thing that I've learned over the years in picking a good lake to go to you, you, you go to Google Earth, we didn't have that before, but now you go to Google Earth, you look at the shoreline, does it have a lot of habitat? You know, is it surrounded? Does it have boat docks, bulrushes, lily pads, wild rice? Lots of shallow water habitat, big percentage of shallow water habitat. That's one thing. Then it's got to have decent weed growth on the flats. And then you want, want to ha have some, dro some drop off areas, a little bit of stain to the water. It is a plus. That's the makings of, of a fantastic a bass lake in our part of the part of the world. But you need cover. These lakes that everything comes a little ways off the drop, a little ways out, and drops to 90 feet of water and comes up on the end where you have no living space, no structure, anything. They're no, they're, the lakes are terrible. Yeah, you get an occasional freak fish, but those lakes just don't hold no numbers of fish. They're not made for largemouth bass. On an average, when I look at a lake and look at the structure, I like the lake to be 50% shallow break line and shallow water, yeah, you know, with habitat on it. The other 50% deep. Then I know I'm gonna get some fish. That's the criteria we look for. You know, Big Bite Baits is our major soft bait partner in everything we do. Big Bite Baits, Swim and Craw. You know, bread and butter in any bass fisherman's tackle bat box on the back of a jig. You know, but I got a bunch of other soft baits too on a variety of different kind of delivery systems that we're using. We're Texas rigged on some stuff. We got Tokyo rig, a stick worm, a, a best flipping bait ever, and I'll catch some bass out of that when we get in tighter cover later. You know, so we're actually mixing it up and you're gonna catch, oh, we'll probably catch a, a fish or two on every bait we're gonna throw today, on every, every bait. World's best punch bait, and it is, and it is. Ever since Big Bite came out with this thing a few years ago, I have fallen in love with it. You know, you, you rig it right, and you, you, you need a tungsten weight, the right hook, peg it, and it vir virtually crashes through everything. I've caught so many big fish in heavy cover on that deep and shallow the last few years. It's a sweet, sweet bait, boy. That's a, that's a big one. Just Tokyo rigging back behind Dad. Well, that's a big largemouth. Holy cow. That's, come here. Oh, nice thing with that big braid. Oh, yeah, that's a tank. Look at that, the size of that one. And, you know, when you can trigger these fish with a number of different presentations, and one of my favorites is a Tokyo rig like this. Oh, the thing got bent, that's fine. Especially in thick, thick weeds when you're going after big fish. It's a heavy rod, straight, thick braid and Tokyo rigging to get big bass like this. So the rod I'm using here, this is a St. Croix Legend Tournament bass and it's a seven foot, four inch, heavy power, fast action. And I'm making shorter casts, so I don't really need a long rod. So seven, four is just fine. And the fast action on it allows for just a little bit of give. You, know, you don't want too much in there, but also the heavy power 
adds to the backbone. You know, when I have heavy braid on here, heavy weeds, and a big fish to be able to crank those bass right out of there. So the reel is a Daiwa Zillion HD size 100 HS, and you can see the handles here are great to give you some leverage when you're cranking down on these big fish out of the cover. It's a 7.3 gear ratio, which is a really nice balance for a lot of different fishing applications, but especially here for Tokyo rigging and thick weeds. So the line, this is 40 pound Suffix 131 braid and this has near zero stretch. You don't need a leader on here when you're fishing this way. And this gives you perfect strength, power. It's also a nice subtle line. And I like this green color like this when you're fishing in and around the weeds, but this is great, not only for Tokyo rigging, but you can also fish you know, jigs on this as well as frog fishing as well. Good what one. Got? Good one, Troy. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. We are loaded for bear. We got you know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rods on a planet. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these die with drag. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. Look at this toad. Oh, she's such a toad. Match for yours, baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, when you set on those, you know you got a, a donkey. When the rod doesn't go nowhere, <laughs> you know, when you come back, it just sits there. I'm looking at these fish on Mega Live. And you know, on Mega Live, they look really good when they're this big. <laughs> they like to really show themselves off. Ooh, those are some big fish. Yeah, you know, we hit the nail on the head today for a terrible day, didn't know what to do. We punted, plan A, went in the garbage can, and I said, I got, I got a lake, a secret spot. And so far, so good. You know, this is classic Minnesota summertime fishing. I'll put her in a live well. We gotta take some pictures later, Troy. We'll get a couple stills. Yeah, that's a big one. Get a rarated yeah. fast, yeah. hard aeration on them. Mm -hmm. You know, the distribution of largemouth bass is, you know, it truly is, we're, oh, it is world. This, I don't think this one is as big. I think this is a little one. It's little one. It is worldwide and you can catch them in little ponds and tiny little ponds in the city. You can catch them in lakes out in the countryside. You can catch them in rivers, creeks, streams. I've caught big bass from a big boat. I've caught them from the shore. And I think the appeal of largemouth bass and their distribution is why they are so popular. So even if you don't have a boat, you can catch them still in a kayak with a backpack and, and a, just a, a spinning rod like this. Yeah, technology like me sitting right here on Spotlock on my Minn Kota. What an amazing tool that became for us. And the list goes on and on and on. And what this high school fishing phenomenon that has swept this nation really has had an impact on the sport too. Let's face it, when you're young, your attention span, unless you're like I was and obsessed with fishing, yeah, yeah, you know, your attention span is short lived. So you gotta have action, you gotta have something biting. And the one thing about bass fishing, you get bit regularly. Any of these kids can put a Ned rig on or a wacky worm and start throwing it around on any body of water and something's gonna bite on it. They are gonna get a bite. And that's what keeps them intrigued. <laughs> I'm gonna grab him. He's borderlining on a flipper, but I don't want to. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I could have flipped him maybe. You know, on, on some days, on some bodies of water, a bass like that would be, yeah, you know, you catch a bunch of bit, but then you got a good day on the water. These are juniors in comparison to some of the ones that we caught a little bit earlier, for sure. But that's still a good fish. Good school of fish. We probably caught a dozen out of one spot lock position here, and some big ones. You know, I was fortunate enough to be around when bass fishing was just starting to explode 
and with tournaments. I fished a lot of tur tournaments. I fished three classics. I won two BASS tournaments. Oh, he's got another got one. Another one. Yeah, that's a good one. That was way up there. The uh, we got into a little bit sparser weeds out here. So then, ooh, coming in with the Ned rig, kind of yeah, not bad. If I was going anywhere to catch bass, I'm gonna have a Ned rig on, regardless of where they are. This thing just, you know, whether whether they're oh, deep or shallow, just the Ned rig produces. Like I said, I was around when bass fishing was started to explode. My first bite and taste of it happened on a chain of lakes in northern Illinois. And there was some derbies that were on Saturday, uh, Saturday and Sunday weekends, and my brother Ron and I started to fish them. And I said, boy, this is fun. And then along the, w the way bass came on the scene, I started fishing the early BASS tournaments and, and grew as bass fishing grew in popularity. And I remember we, we were in the TV fishing show business and one of the television shows that we wanted to do is I said, I'm gonna do a television show and show everybody about how exciting bass fishing can be. And we filmed it from me leaving in Minnesota and going all the way to Tennessee. And what are the odds? I won the tournament. I won it and we filmed it. I said, my buddy Skip James looked, he goes like this, I don't know, well, it was meant to be. And I guess it was. I fish a number of bass tournaments and enjoy doing it. They're, they're a lot of fun. And it is interesting to see the advancements in fishing, not just bass fishing, fishing overall. That comes from bass anglers, bass tournaments in particular. It pushes the industry forward not only with baits, but new advancements in marine technology like live imaging. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. So that was on a number eight Shadrach. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. Do you want to be able to see in the water? The adventure begins. Got him. Another big one, Troy. Yeah, oh, another back one? Back. Yeah. One thing about largemouth bass, they don't get finicky like a walleye can get or, or a smallmouth at certain times of the year. That's why these fish are so popular all over the country. No matter what the weather conditions are, you know, you can catch some largemouth in the lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. And in our part of the world up here in the upper Midwest, when you're catching bass like this and the last couple that Troy and I had, uh, it makes for a great, great, great day of fishing. This is top end to what you can and can expect. But again, it's ABC, simple lure presentation on the edges. You, you know, mix it up in a day like this, we're catching fish on all five, five different presentations. I'm gonna release her and put her back. End of the story is simple. Get on a weed line, take these different kind of baits, feel it out in the day, and I guarantee you, you're gonna get bit on a toke, a jig worm, a jig, or this, mix them up when you see, and you can have one of the best days you expected, no matter what the weather is, when you get a chance to go fishing, go fish. And many times you're gonna be surprised at the bite like we're seeing today. I knew we'd do something, but I didn't think it was gonna be that good. Hey, Dan and I just came back from a successful shoot in Ontario sunset country. Yep. We had a great time up there filming. And on our way back and our time up there, there in the evening in the lodge, we talk about a lot of things. And he brought up something that I said, hey, you gotta share this with our viewers on one of the clothes. So go for it. Well, about uh, around 10 years ago, I uh, recently got married and we wanted to start a family. So Alyssa and I were trying naturally and it just was not happening. So um, during that time, I had spoke with my dad and uh, we were doing some research into IVF, which is where you take the egg and the semen out and you mix that outside of the body until it starts um, multiplying. And then you take that and they put that back into, into the body. And um, when we were discussing this, I'd ran this by my dad and my dad was naturally sus uh, suspect about it. You know, he said, you're playing God. And I thought about it for a while, and it does sound kind of different, I guess, you know. Um, and uh, I got back to him and I said, well, 
Dad, I said, if your heart valve was failing, I said, would you just say, well, that's it, I guess I'm checking out, Lord, that's it. Or if you broke your leg, would you just say that that's what it is? And my dad sat and he thought about that and he did a 180. And when my dad does a 180, he does a 180 and he was so committed to IVF after that and uh, not, not only financially, but spiritually behind us. Uh, you know, praying and all of that stuff. And I never had a, a, an issue with it because I believe that my faith and science works together in concert. And I know you've seen that in your life dealing with Aunt Mary and the issues that you've dealt with. So um, to me, I, I had no problem with it. I think th I thank the Lord for doctors. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know? Amen. So, and luckily, and uh, thank, the, thank the Lord, we have two beautiful, healthy kids now, you know, and that was thanks to my father and his 180 on <laughs> on science and faith, so. Great words, great words. Hey, from all of us here at The Edge, you have a great fishing season. We'll see you on the water. Oh, there it is. Got one? She came in. Oh, got him. Way to go, Shar. Good job. Good job, good job, good job. Wasn't that cool? We saw that side image again. You got it. Ooh, coming on, coming on. Oh my goodness, is that fantastic? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and we got the muskie. Woo hoo! <laughs> Super yes. yes! This is fantastic. I know it's late on Eagle. You have to quit a half hour after sunset. And it is, we've got 10 minutes to go. It's an overcast night. And we just saw fish out here on side imaging and Char was throwing a crate bit at it. Bingo, got it. Musky Palooza is off to a good start, Char. Oh my God, yes, yes, yes. Good job, Char, that was so cool. You have to have confidence in your electronics. Like it's been one of those days, we kind of knew it. We drove up this morning and you could tell, like when I woke up this morning in Baxter, it was like if you were on the water, you would catch a muskie, and it was awesome all morning. The temperatures were high, the humidity was high, and of course when we got here, we got a little rain, and then you could just kind of feel the temperatures drop, the humidity drop, and it was like, gosh, it kind of feels like we missed our window. But of course, you know, sunset is a, always a great window, and we weren't seeing anything on live, nothing on 2D. It was like all the fish in the lake went to the bottom, and then Bingo bango, we saw one on side imaging, we knew it was there, she made like three casts at it. Got it, awesome, awesome, awesome. Come on up, Charlotte, let's look at your muskie. Right. Here it is, so this is muskie number one. We're at Eagle Lake Island Lodge, my favorite place to be, Eagle Lake, and this is an awesome spot. Jim and Char run the lodge and we're holding a deal called Muskie Palooza, first ever. So <laughs> Char and I are out trying to catch some muskies and First evening, a couple hours in, we got one. Oh my God, I can't believe it. It was awesome. It was, it was awesome. So good. So, great, 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 great start. We're gonna have an awesome time fishing late September on Eagle Lake in Northwest Ontario, Sunset Country. I'll let you let this one go, Char. I'll set it in the water and you can do the honors. Closed captioning is provided by Smooth Moves. Adjustable boat seat suspensions for a smoother ride. Okay, right there. Feet away, that way. Here comes, here comes, here comes the gauge. It shot up, shot up. Yep, there he is. Oh, there he is. Oh, peeled off. Nice one, too. That was cool. He just shot up after it. Boy, that bait rolled over him and he just went, you can see it on the live. It just went straight up vertically. He was like, oh, he's going to hit it. And then he saw the boat and turned. The first time folks come to a body of water like this, it is super intimidating. Everything looks awesome. So where do you start? And I, I just always tell people, hey, if it looks good, fish it. Musky fishing is all about confidence. And this water has lots of muskies and big muskies. And if you fish good spots often, you'll end up catching some. There's one. Boy, that thing was flying. A little, oh, he might bite it. He's, Got him. Oh, I lost him. God darn it. That was super cool. You see that? That was great. Ooh, little guy, but got my heart going. Sweet two on this spot. Awesome. Oh, oh. 
Yep. Got him? Uh, yep. Came back for it, huh? Shars on, yay! <laughs> <laughs> cool, that one really wants to get caught, doesn't it? Exactly what we like to see. The crankbait. Ooh. There we go, Char. Way to go. <laughs> Good job, Char. Oh my pumped. gosh. So this time of year, we're, we're up here, it's the last part of September, and this time of year, fish can be on rocks, they can be on weeds, the pattern can be bucktails, it can be topwaters, it can be crankbaits, it can just be just about anything. And uh, this is just a lot of fun to just go, everything that looks good, you fish it, and muskie show up. Come on in your muskie, Char. Okay. All right. <laughs> there it is. Look at that little guy, huh? Mm -hmm. They're so pretty. Oh my God. He really wanted to bite. That <laughs> thing really wanted to bite. Cool. I think he's a little mad. Yeah, should we let him go? <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, see, dude? Yes. Oh my God. Woo. Yes. Yes. That is awesome. <laughs> Woohoo! This segment is brought to you by Wavy Label Eyewear, backed by a lifetime warranty. We see what others don't. Oh, oh, I'm gonna grab it. It's a pike, it was a big, giant pike. Wow, that thing wants to eat, Char. You're gonna catch that. That's like a 40 inch northern. Ooh, I'd like that. Kind of throw back, Char, that way. Back straight out? Yep. A tip that I would offer for how you set your drag when you're musky fishing is I really like to have the drag essentially locked or very, very, very tight. So it's extremely hard to pull line. That way if a fish bites way out there when I set the hook, the drag isn't slipping and I'm getting the most penetration that I can. But once I get good hooks into the fish, you'll notice on the side of this, this is a Daiwa Pro Rex, this is a star drag here. So as soon as I'm starting to reel in, I'm just taking my thumb I'm either lo lo loosening or tightening the drag as I'm, as I'm reeling in. So I want to start backing off the drag as the fish gets closer. That way if he goes on a quick run, I've got the drag that's going to work for me. I always try to free spool, but muskies have a tendency to just bolt really fast. And sometimes you can get pinned where you can't you know, un disengage the reel. So just definitely make sure that you're backing the drag off as the fish gets closer and it gets near the boat. So you've got kind of those two safety features, the option for free spool, but then also a loose drag. And when you go to cast again, don't forget to really cinch that baby down. I'd say one thing that's really important that I always tell our, our new guests here at Eagle Lake, you really got to be prepared that at any point you could be getting a muskie. And everyone needs to know how to handle a big fish. Make sure you have a good net, hook removal tools, keeping them in the water as long as possible. So, you know, just always be ready for a, a big fish maybe on your hook, even if you don't expect it. Ooh, she's there, she's there. See one? Yep, she's there. I Get him, Char. Saw, I think she saw the boat though. Come on, Vic. Baby, come back. Was it excited or not overly? Oh, it was hungry. It was, it wanted yeah. to eat. Yeah, it did. <sighs> What's amazing to me is how far musky equipment has come since I started musky fishing. And today, the rods, the reels, the line, the leaders, everything is designed in musky fishing to be for a specific presentation. And I've been spending a lot of time this trip throwing huge bucktails, and the rod that I'm using for this is St. Croix Legend Tournament. This series has been all new, it's all, all redesigned, and it's the nine foot heavy power fast action. They call this the Big Nasty. And I really like this stick because it just really takes a lot of power to flex this stick and you need that when you've got that much drag on these big blades like that. But it still bends when you hook a fish. It still bends through the midsection so it keeps the fish pinned. It's not one of those pool cues where it never flexes but it takes a lot to flex it and it's the perfect tool for throwing big bucktails like this. You can also throw big crankbaits on it but late in the fall I definitely like to have a rod that's got, you know, capable of throwing the really big stuff. And now. For the reel, I've got Daiwa's Pro Rex. This is a 5.3 uh, gear ratio on here. So I like the lower gears for throwing these really huge blades. If you've got a reel that's got a seven or an eight gear ratio and you try throwing 
magnum blades like this, you're gonna be shot in no time. So having a lower geared reel just makes it easier to pull those big baits in. And then for the line, I'm fishing 65 pound Suffix Pro Mix braid. And what I love about this line more than anything is it has tremendous shock strength. You don't lose baits with this, with this line. So that's how most of the musky baits are lost. You go to cast, backlash, boom. You send the lure into outer space, but this stuff, it's just amazing. You can backlash a pounder and this line doesn't snap. So it's a really, really awesome line for chucking musky stuff. So that's my setup for this late fall big bucktail fishing. So I really love blackfish rain gear. I have been looking for something as a woman who fishes a lot and there's lots of rainy weather in Northern Ontario, lots of cold, rainy weather. It's so hard to find something that fits women. And this just fits really good. It's got nice adjustable features so that, you know, if I happen to get a little bigger, I can still use this. And the bottoms, um, zip up pockets. I mean, it's like a woman was involved in the design of it. It's warm, it's, it's rainproof, and really comfortable. And it fits me well. I love it. So that was on a number eight shad wrap. Your style of boat control is really key. One that was there from the very beginning. You want to be able to see in the water. The adventure begins. We are loaded for bear. We got You know, bites. there's so many different ways to fish for water. Dependability and efficiency. Simple, fast, and easy. The best rides on a planet. No doubt technology catches you fish, and I've got like the sweetest setup in this boat for fish finding technology. It has all of the most up-to-date sonar equipment in here. And one of the biggest tools for fishing the shield water that I found is having the live imaging on here. So it's forward facing sonar. These Canadian spots are laid out and they're so complex that a lot of times you're you know, bumping into where the most likely fish holding spot would be. You don't know how they're laid out, but with the transducer on the front of my trolling motor here, I can look out in front of us and I always know what's over here. So I can turn the deal over here and say, oh, look Char, there's a patch of weeds that's 30 feet out in front of us. Oh, and there's gonna be a big boulder up here. I know exactly what it looks like even though I've never even been there. So it's a really, really amazing tool for seeing exactly what's in front of you. The other thing, how I have mine set up is I actually use side imaging to look off to the side. So I'm using forward to see what's in front of me and then I have a side imaging transducer up front and then I can see what the shoreline is like. So that little, that little complement of sonar technology, the live plus the side imaging gives me just an amazing view of what's happening underneath the water in these really complex Canadian lakes. There he is, got him. Woohoo! Sweet! Yes, yes, yes! Got one! I don't know how good it's hooked, Char. We're about to find out. Barely hooked. That's okay. Look at this. Musky action. Quite fantastic. See if I learn okay, anything yep. on Come my on right up here, Char. Okay, okay, just hold the bag. I'll get bring it around bag. to you. Okay, yeah, I got my bag. Okay, now scoop it right now. Yay, you did it. Woo. Fantastic. We've had a number of encounters with fish up here. There he is. And it definitely is <laughs> the crankbait. A, a presentation related deal right now because we've seen fish on bucktails. Ooh, that's a fat sucker, look at that. Bucktails, we've seen them on, this was on a crankbait. We've had a couple <laughs> other ones on crankbaits and camp guys have been getting them on rubber. So. This uh, fall, kind of right before turnover, is a time when you just want to pack everything you've got. Look at how thick these are. Eagle Lake muskies are so thick and beautiful. I and love if, them. And if, and that's, it, if that's the same one that followed my crankbait, yeah. and then you got it on the bucktail, that's pretty it's cool. truly everything works, yeah, right? Yeah, everything works. All right, I'm going to get it back. We can actually see the lodge <laughs> from right where we're at right now. How cool is that? Off you go, Mr. Muskie. Woo! One of the things that is so awesome about fishing up here in sunset country for muskies is 
How often muskies oh, yeah. bite oh, yeah. at the side of the boat. Oh, if you want to be a good muskie fisherman up here, you have to be good at the boat. And what I mean by that is you need to be prepared on every cast to execute a figure eight. So no matter what, you do a figure eight on every cast. Some trips you'll catch more than 50% of your yeah, fish yeah, will awesome. be caught right at the boat. And so we were sitting around camp last night talking and there was a lot of questions about doing a proper figure eight. So I'll walk you through what I like to do. I always know, have a plan where your bait's gonna go as it approaches the boat. So I like to come in, drop the rod down, I'll bend my knees, come out, back in towards center, go deep, come back out. And what you don't wanna do is ever overextend yourself. So you don't wanna be coming way out here and then trying to turn. The whole idea is to be able to let the fish here we go, here we go. make the corners with you. It. And so speed and direction here's, changes here's, are of here's, course so big I... deals and catching fish anytime, and a figure eight does both of yeah, those things. So cool. watch this in terms of speed and direction as I come in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come right, I'm gonna push the bait down deep, I'm gonna go fast, I'm gonna hang it real slow in this corner, I'll cut through the center fast, I'll come back up, hang it in the corner, come back down, up, and you hang it in those corners, and that's generally where you'll get your bites. Now I'm right-handed, so I want the fish to come on this outside right corner. If a fish bites there, it's easy for me to lean back into my body and stick the fish. So I want, I want to see which direction the fish takes the bait and I want to pull the bucktail or whatever lure you're using back into the fish to try to get the, the best hook set. So always know when you're reeling in, based on where your cast is, how the boat's moving, are you going to go left or right and be prepared every time to go into that figure eight. Make, make at least one big turn on every single cast, because I promise you, if you fish up here enough, you are gonna get blindsided by a giant musk and you don't wanna be pulling your bait out of the water. They like to eat when you're throwing the right thing. You don't have all bluebird flat calm days. Just a perfect eating size fish. See, that's what I'm talking about, these die with drag. We got walleye stuff, we got crappie stuff, we got pike stuff. This boat is rigged up about as nice, easy to use, and it flat out works. It's a must have when you're talking about big waves. Well, these trout are so darn tough. This bait is legendary. There we go. That's a good one. <laughs> Feels pretty nice, Char. Woohoo! Oh my gosh. Okay, keep it together, center. <laughs> this feels like a big one. Oh God. This feels like a big one. I haven't seen it yet. Oh my God. Stay down, baby. Oh, it is a great big one. It's a oh huge one, Char. Oh my God. If you can get the net, that would be awesome. You bet, you bet. Whew, kind of busting our butts, thinking something, anything could come into play here, what's gonna work? And I just had to stick with the bucktail. Whew, yes. And it paid off because a big muskie just came and ate a bucktail. Oh. Whew. Let's see if we can get her this time, Char. Oh, no, no, no. Whew. Okay, this will be the shot. Okay. I keep thinking that's going to be the shot. You want to go in? No. Okay, here you go. Here you go. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Head first. No, don't get her caught in the net. Oop. So just get the net out of the water, Char. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then a scoop when you're ready. Okay. Okay, this is good. No. Nope. There you go. You got it, Char. Yay! Woo! Good job. <laughs> good job. Okay. Oh. I got the net. <laughs> I did Thank you. Myself. You did a great job. <laughs> Woo! -hoo. We got a monster. <gasps> this is what we came up here for. <sighs> we got an eagle lake giant. <laughs> yes. Holy yeah, cow. baby. Yeah, baby. I'm gonna just try to get this. She's caught in the kind of a funky spot here. Find her that bucktail. Look at that. There we go. Whew. Notice I was. Whew. I'm trying to unhook it, and I'm like, <laughs> I can't get the thing to go. Oh my goodness, man! Oh man! Whew. It feels so good. This this time of year up here is definitely. A time when you just have to be confident that a bite could happen at any time. I guess that's really musky fishing in general and just keep grinding on it and this kind of stuff happens. Whew. Sweet musky. 
There we go. That thing just wolfed it. Such a great bite. Bucktail wins again. Shocking, huh? <laughs> Let me show you guys this beast. What a fish. Beast. Oh, look at that sucker, huh? Just an Eagle Lake tanker. This is my favorite place in the world to fish muskie. Sunset Country and at Eagle Lake here. You always have a shot. Anytime your bait is wet at a fish like this in fall, it has to be the coolest time of year to get them. Woohoo! Thanks, Char. Oh my God, that is a beautiful fish. You know, numerous times people send me an email or ask me either a speaking engagement or something like that. Just, hey, why do you go to church? I've watched it on television. I don't get much out of it when I go, why do you go to church? They're searching. Well, for me, it's simple. I feed my body. Yeah, 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 you know, I feed my mind. I, I read the Bible. I read up, uplifting books about fishing, the fishing industry, uh, uh, things that make make me uh, 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 understand more things. G gives me a better view of things, more knowledge. And uh, 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 and I go. The main reason I go is it is refreshing to me. I feed my body. I feed my mind, and I got to feed my spirit. I read the Bible every morning, almost every morning. And I go to church on a regular basis as much as I can possibly make it happen. And it's refreshing. It gets me going for the week. And uh, uh, the other part of that question that I say that, that I answer answer them with is, is you know where they say, I don't get anything out of it. I know a lot of people over the years that have left the church that they were raised in and went to a different church and uh, their life has changed. They weren't being fed there for any particular reason. Sometimes it's them, God might want you in another place, and I believe that happens. And uh, they weren't receiving in one church, and they got in another one, and they're serving the Lord, they're on fire for God. And it's possible, I'm not saying it's the answer, I'm not there to divide churches up. I know a lot of people, myself included, that left one denomination to go to a different uh, 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 type of church, church that is totally Bible-based. And I want, if you are one of those people that is searching, that is looking, let me give you one important tip. You're going to a church for the first time, sit in a parking lot and watch how many people are walking into that church with a Bible in their hand. If you see a good portion of that happening, it's a good bet. That, that this church is on fire for the things of God. If you don't see the body of believers, majority of it walking in with a Bible, you might want to take a, a second thought. I'm just sharing some stuff that's on my heart with you. Maybe some of you are ready to seek God in a different way. That is not meant to divide or be a negative thing. It's a real thing. Hey, from all of us here at The Edge, you have a good, safe fishing season. We'll see you on the water.